FT taking over camps, and that continues here as the tour in Florida is stopping at Nats camp for today's show. So Krasinski's out there right from the jump with our first guest of the day. AJ, you got us? You ready to go, dude? We got you. Yeah, I think Lane can hear you too, so don't say anything bad about him. Okay, Scott? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Scott, you're Never banking lost. again, guys. Don't worry about it. You know, my I'm pretty soon I'm going to be like so red that, you know, I'm going to match the AJ's, red. My... AJ's sunburn tour? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we get All right, let's F- get F- going F- here. FD sunscreen, please. Uh, yeah, Lane Thomas can teach you a little bit about, you know, how you handle uh, daily sunshine. AJ, I know you've only lived in Florida your entire life, but I have nothing bad to say about Lane. He had an incredible season last year. I, I guess the only bad thing I will say, as we can be honest, is the Nets were not a playoff team last year. So, Lane, how you doing, dude? Welcome to uh, the party here at FT. And tell me how camp is going and how this team might be able to shock the world and be in playoff contention yeah man it's gonna be back thanks for having me again um yeah i think i mean you guys saw last year i think a lot of the young guys are improving every day and um i mean i think it's hard to make a big jump in this league but you know i think over the last couple years we've you know won i think 15 more games in the year before and just you know making those small strides i think you look up in a couple years and you have a chance to you know sneak in there so hopefully we can do that is there more excitement at a camp because this is a i've been to you know, three or four now and talking to everybody and they are excited about not only this year, but the next like year. And then the year after that, because of the kids you have not only here yourself included, cause it's not like you're an old guy at this yeah. point. Right. But like the woods and the cruises and the McKenzie Gore taking the next step. Right. So, I mean, I, this is the most exciting that I've heard a team talk about their players coming up. Yeah, for sure. I think, I think you want that. I think you want, you know, a lot of young guys, you know, it keeps everybody accountable too. It's like, I'm like, man, I got, bunch of young outfielders coming up i gotta keep playing (laughs) well but but no it's it's awesome i think uh we have a good group a lot of the guys are outfielders so i've got to hang around them a lot and man they're they're good people so it's been it's been fun do you help them i mean obviously Um, you help them but yeah i think because you said like oh man i gotta play good or they might you know they're outfielders too (laughs) yeah yeah, i mean there's like a fine line you have to walk right no no you don't want to give them all your tricks (laughs) yeah yeah for sure no but um yeah it's been good i think like i said they're all good good dudes they uh they want to learn it's more just getting getting your routines down you know how that goes it's like you get to camp you have a long you have a lot of time during the day and if you try to you know fill that time with with too much work you get exhausted so it's just you know getting some good work in and and hanging out and you know showing them the ropes how does it change knowing that you're an everyday guy because your career kind of has taken off i mean i think everybody's when you play more you have an opportunity to show what you can do and you've taken that you know bull by the horns where, what, what does spring training look like differently compared to when you were, I don't know if I can make this team or not. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, I think it just shows you how rare opportunities are. So when you get them, you have to kind of run with them. I think, uh, everybody, you know, works hard, but you know, to get in a situation like that, something has to go your way or, you know, um, it comes, comes a little earlier for some people or, you know, they get, a little more money out of the draft or, or whatever, you know, that, that creates opportunity. But I think, uh, you know, put your head down and, and work hard. And when that time comes, you know, you can't, can't take it for granted. Lane, can you give me scouting reports on Dylan Cruz and James Wood? I heard Wood's been terrible in spring training so far. <laughs> <laughs> Man, we played a little game in the cage yesterday. It was, uh, I don't know, just like a couple of the guys off the machine, you know, the game got canceled. So we were like, we're going to hit a little more and, um, Let's just say their bats make a little louder noiser than mine. So it was, it's fun to watch, man. James Wood, it's like the ball just, it just sounds different off his bat. It goes a little farther than, like I said, than Well, mine. dude, he's like six foot eight. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It's like Monster. just the leverage he creates. And the, yeah, it's, I don't even have words for it, honestly. So, Lane, this is how you know you're officially a veteran guy. You're not in the simulated game they have going on behind us, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So you got out of that because exactly. I'm assuming you're going to play against your old team today, the Cardinals. Yeah, yeah. So you're going to get, you're going to get. I think Michaelis is pitching. You're going up there looking for a little cutter away. You're going to. I actually was pretty good friends with him. I was like, I was like joking around, like, dude, I'm going to like just push bunch and try to beat him to first base, you know, something like that, just something funny. But Do no, it. he's. I, I faced him a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I might. I don't know if he's on, actually. I think it might be Sonny Gray. So well, on the uh, listen, MLB. Is... No, I said I, I said the same thing I, on the app. It showed Michaelis, but. Oh. We'll see. Right. Well, who would you rather face? Um, that's a good question. I think I've seen Michaelis more, so I know what to expect. So I think I would rather face him at this moment. I'm, I'm okay. going to face Sonny since my first year with uh, the Cardinals. Ah. He's Cincinnati. like a 5'10 righty. Yeah. A little high heater. Yeah. <laughs> a little big <laughs> ball. 
yeah. sinker every once in a while, yeah, yeah, run yeah. it up and in on it. Oh, yeah. the cur- it does one up and in, maybe yeah, dive yeah, out, yeah. look for the curveball. <laughs> really spring, though, you know, so I don't know if he's sure. got the full snap yeah, on it. Yeah. What are you looking for in spring? Because everyone's different in spring training. So what, like, are you a, are you, you're not a tracker? Are you a tracker guy? Like where you get the live VP and you just watch the ball go by? Are you a swinger? Because I was a swinger. Like I wanted to swing. Oh, hundred percent. I'm in the same boat. I'm like, get the bad swings out of the way. Like figure out where I'm at yeah. timing wise, like get your chases out, you know, make the pitchers feel good <laughs> coming into camp. Um, yeah, I think it's all about timing. I think right now it's like a little timed up. Like, you, you know, you're, you're, I'm getting my hits off the off speed stuff a little late on the heater kind of right now. So I think hopefully that changes in the next 10 days or so start hitting a few fastballs that's kind of you know i think that's something that changes you know to, to, to back to your question earlier is like you get older you know uh you get to a point where you know you're, you're making the team and it's like you know you have a little more time to figure that out where when you're coming in trying to make those teams it's like man i wanted to come out and get three hits the first day and like show them i was ready so i guess that's uh to answer that question earlier lane if you have an opening in the baseball ops department if you can send a rec AJ Przinsky, you know, let him know since he's got all the scouting reports. It's got to be a remote job, though. He does not generally want to leave the state of Florida. Or be around people. Or be around people. So it'd be great <laughs> in studio, AJ. That's a good point. Um, what What's this with some outfield target practice I heard? And they had your face and Victor Robles' face up there as targets. Is this true? Yeah, so we had two team captains with all the outfield guys, and they put nets up and then put our faces, like, inside the net. So I think the point system was, like, you could – I mean, if you if it was a horrible throw, you get minus points. And then, like, everybody kind of added their scores up. We made, like, two throws to each bag. So, I don't know. It's been fun, man, keeping it keeping it light. You know, it's competitive. And, um, you know, we got some good work in, so it's, it's been really fun. Dude, I watched you guys out here on the turf field earlier. You guys work. That's what you guys consider work? Yeah, yeah. I think it was Gerardo Parra's hitting like yeah. 17 hoppers Choppers. to you guys, and you guys are like, oh, watch me fake like I'm going to throw the guy out at home, and then they come up and they like lob it to the guy. T- I mean, that's sure. that's what spring training is all about, right? It's more about getting on your feet, yeah. getting moving around. And then once the, I mean, once the games start, it becomes almost like a regular season. I For mean, sure. you do a little bit more than what you do, but it's still like, okay, I'm back in the routine now. I'm playing, and you're playing how many bats? About 50 bats you want to get, 50, 60 yeah, bats? Yeah, I think so. I think it's a good number. Yeah, man, man Davey keeps it keeps it light. I mean, we, the, the first, you know, 10 days of camp, you know, before games start, and then that first week, it's like we get a lot of work in, go over, like, you know, fundamental defense and, like, what they expect from us, and then, you know, he, he gets it. And we have a rough – I mean, they went to Fort Myers a couple of days ago and then, you know, back-to-back day games and stuff, and then we had a couple of days where it was like, you know, we're just going to cage, work on some defense, and – you know, start the week out fresh. So he's, he's been awesome about that. You didn't have to go to Fort Myers, though, did you? I did not. See, veteran. Yeah. Veteran, Kratzy. <laughs> veteran See, right here. Lane, tell him. You're you're still not that far removed. Tell AJ, look at AJ and say, you never had to earn your your spot for the last 16 <laughs> years of your career. Spring oh, training cool. is a lot about this. Oh, like, yeah. uh, uh, I'm not on the trip. Does that mean they're – does that mean they're cutting guys? Are we not getting meal money? It's Monday. We get meal money on Monday. Am I getting cut? Am I getting sent down to field nine? That's yes. what I've been there for sure. Yeah, for sure. But you guys had a little uh, a little card reveal. Tell us about this this card game. And we have the video. I think we have the video. And it got absolutely ruckus. Oh, it's tweet. a tweet. We have the tweet. Well, you can Sorry. talk us through it. Give us. The yeah, we need play. we need we need more more insight on what happened with the with the with the card reveal. Yeah. So like last September, um, some guys came up. Like man, I was when I was like twelve. Like I was baseball card like fanatic. And then you know you get in high school and you know your other things start interesting you. So I think I probably sold them for other stuff and. Um, yeah, some of these guys came up in September and they're like opening boxes in the clubhouse. I'm like, dude, this is like I forgot how like electric. They're opening is. baseball card. Yeah, boxes. like boxes, like and random. Trying... They were buying them and opening random. Well, it's like it's like the nicer boxes. Like they have like autographs and like uh, you know, it's big like league a... boxes. Yeah, big league boxes for sure. And they and, paid for these boxes. Yeah, or they, they paid for them. Oh wow, okay. Um, so you know, we started like on the road. You know, none of the wives came. I'm like, shoot, I'll go with you to these card shops. And then we got to spring, and some guys were like, dude, let's order some, and like we'll all chip in. And get like a really nice box. So that was the video from the other day. We I don't I don't remember the name of the box. It was like Diamond Icon. It's like Tops, this nicest box nope. they sell. Well, I mean, what'd you get? 
Um, I got an Otani out of 15 signed card. Oh. And somebody else pulled like Bobby Witt 101 and some, some crazy stuff. Yeah, guys were jumping around. The media was in there. So I think that's kind of what, you know, got everybody interested. But I didn't even see the tweet. What did the tweet say? It said, uh, what did it say? Riley Adams had a box of cards and you guys were all up. There it is. Well, walked, in it, walked into the Nats clubhouse to see everyone circled around. Riley Adams wearing latex gloves, people yelling at intervals. Apparently, they all put money on box of rare baseball cards and finally arrived coming from Chelsea. Riley, Riley, uh, was able to observe. We drew out of a hat. So we all chipped in the box. We drew out of a hat which card you got. So, like, I drew my own name, which I got the first pick. So, I, you know, obviously took the Otani. And then mm-hmm. Riley was opening up with the gloves. So, you know, it's – it's crazy now. Oh, if so you open them like you if didn't. They're sit, damaged or like they get you know your finger oils yeah. on them or something like you know. It's, so you didn't like bad. lay out the packs and then you got no, to pick which like, pack you wanted. No, it was like we threw money and bought this box and like we're drawn to see like who oh, gets so the first pick. Oh, this was like fantasy pick. football. Oh yeah, it was it was ah. intense. Yeah. All right. So did you get your money back? Did you get your money back from that Otani card? I mean, value wise, obviously you got to sell it. Yeah. No, no, no. I don't. I don't think I'm going to sell it. But I think if I wanted to, I think I could like triple my money on it. Yeah. It was a. It was a good one. What's his signature look like? Um, it's it just it's like, like an SO? Slash? It's like a big O and some – I've seen some of them are different. I don't know. I don't know if he he has two. I've seen like his Japanese signature, which is oh. really cool. His Ichiro's look like Scribble Scrabble. Yeah. I feel like a lot of them are kind of like that. I mean, Ichiro's he literally look like – A pitcher's sig and a hitter sig. <laughs> <laughs> a pitcher sig. Would, Why not? He's a unicorn. Would it, be, would it be more valuable – if you got him to sign his name, just write his name in Japanese on a 15, one of 15, or is that, I'm not, I'm not up on the. It's all about rare. Like if, if there's not many of those, then that's like what people want. You know, it's like all the numbered stuff is in, you know, you want like low numbered cards and stuff. I don't know. I'm kind of a rookie in that aspect. These guys are like Drew Millis, a catcher we have. He's like, you, but you, you get something cool. You hand it to him and he sends it to PSA and like gets it graded. Oh. And all, you know, he's the. He knows he's everything. He's the guru. Yeah. He's the guru. Super. He, hey, Bobby Witt's going to be pissed, dude. They had a one of one Bobby Witt, and he took Otani one of 15. Maybe you can sell it to Bobby Witt. He's got some extra cash. Yeah, he does. Yeah, Bobby Witt will buy those. They've already tried. I think they've messaged him. I think he's in. I don't know. I don't know for sure, but that we, was his plan. He pulled it, and he's like, dude, I think he might buy this. When we had him on, he's like, I try to buy every card of mine. Hey, I'm like, you just got a little money, too. I said, don't, don't sell a, it Just cheap. a little yeah. bit of money. <laughs> There's a 100% <laughs> chance that Bobby Witt will buy that card. So, speaking of money, mm-hmm. with all these young guys coming up, and you seeing where the org's going, you seeing what you did for this team last year, what about a Lane Thomas extension? Hey, I, I wouldn't hate it. I, I like it here, man. I think I think that this team's going in the right direction. And, uh, you know, I would love to be a part of it when we get a chance to slip in the playoffs. So, How soon is that? How soon is that? Because I'm going to ask your manager later on, like, do you feel like when you're in a division with the Phillies and the Braves and what the Mets could be doing in the next few years, do you feel like you're kind of behind the eight ball? Or is there is there a sense in the org where you're like, okay, we're going to do this thing. Just, just watch out for us. Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, I think we don't play them as much anymore. So I think that, I mean, that might help or hurt depending on who else we play, but, um, yeah, I I think it's a tough division. You you see great pitching, but I also think it helps you out because it, you know, you you see a lot of those tough guys, you get to see them more often than the other teams get to see them and and kind of, you know, game plan and stuff. So, um, I think you can look at it both ways. Lane, my last one, what did it mean to you last year when the Nats obviously weren't in playoff range, they're getting phone calls, and Mike Rizzo was very straightforward and vocal that chances were not high that you were going to be moved, and you were a an everyday outfielder, an all-star caliber outfielder in his mind, and he said, unless someone really blows me away, which every team has to listen on everybody, this guy is going to be a part of the Nats. Yeah, I mean, I think that at the end of the day, it makes you feel good. I think it, it, it gives you confidence going out every day that, you know, your front office and your manager believes in you. And um, like I said, those guys gave me the opportunity, you know, two and a half years ago. So um, I think, you know, that, that's a great thing to, to, to have. By the way, you mentioned we mentioned when they're going to make the playoffs. One thing the Nationals approved, like in 2019 when they won, there's a big sign right there, obviously. They'll spend money. For sure. Right. They'll supplement your roster. It's not just like, oh, we have to make sure every one of these prospects is. They'll go out and sign the Scherzer. No They'll go out and sign these guys, yeah. you know, to, to Patrick Corbin, right, to to finalize it. So there's a team and as an organization, as a player in this organization, it has to give you encouragement. Like if we can just get to where we're in striking distance, even if it's this year at the All-Star break, you know they'll go out and get 100%. somebody to put you in position. 
yeah, I think that's, I think everybody knows that. And I think, you know, I think we've, we've put ourselves so far in a good situation and we just got to build off it. So I agree. Lane, pleasure talking to you, man. Appreciate the time. Good to see you again. We looked, I think last time was August. So let's do this again, at least every six months or so. Um, but have fun out there, dude. No, I appreciate it, guys. Anytime, hey, remember, Sunny Gray, high fastball, Come and then on. comes a curveball, right? All right. So, I'm sh- sh- right out there. Dinger, right. Dinger, Dinger today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shoot him right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Lane. Man. Appreciate you. All right, we'll kick it back here for a moment while they get themselves all Thanks, together. So, so yeah, perhaps they're going to get to the start off a little charge the mound action because we had a big past 48 <laughs> hours or so. Shocker. Weekend had some news, but we got to start with the fresh stuff. Zach Wheeler is a Philadelphia Philly for more years, three more years, $126 million. He was going to be a free agent after this season. And now the next time he would be in free agent mode, he would be 37 years old and apparently might even call it a career after that point. At least if you look at someone's article like a Matt Gelb who covers the team on a daily basis, we can show the tweet also from Buster Olney. He said, Wheeler and the Phillies have agreed to a multi year extension. Wheeler would have been the number one free agent pitcher next fall, but instead he stays in Philadelphia by season's end. He also gets the 10-5 rights, so that means he can veto any trade. And they have that press conference going down today. So congrats to Zach and to the Phillies for keeping Wheeler and Nola over a six-month span for a long-ass time. Guys have proven it. Guys have proven it in a city that can be tough on pitchers, can be tough on the ups and downs of pitching, like you only give you only give you the team five innings, four runs, or you give a team seven innings. These are like seven inning guys that might give up four runs. That's not a great outing for them. These guys who are in Cy Young contention year in and year out. But if you give that up and you lose the game, Philly fans, I've seen them. They are fickle and they don't appreciate the consistent stuff that Aaron Nola has done. Wheeler, on the other hand, he has just been dominant throughout this entire – should have been a five-year contract, extending it out another three years here for 42 a year, a million less than what Scherzer's getting at a much younger age. I love this for the Phillies. And maybe I'm just my Philly bias, but Ken Rosenthal reported it here super long time ago. This was going to happen. This was going to be the extension he saw coming. And it's, it's been a huge bargain of a contract for the Phillies. I mean, the first five years of this deal when he signed as a free agent, $118 million. And remember, he turned out a little bit more, including from the Chicago White Sox. White Sox. Probably a good deal. But Bye. AJ, this is, this is a dude who, like, if you go on Fangraph's War, okay? 2021 to 2023, best pitcher in baseball in that time period. That's regular season. And then postseason, he's already, in my mind, kind of an instant legend. Yeah, he's, he was, he's done pretty good in the last couple of postseasons for these Philly guys. I mean, I feel like I feel like this extension was warranted. I feel like this was a good deal. And also, I feel like this extension doesn't keep them away from still getting the big le- one of the big lefties that's still left out on the board. On a, I, I think more of a snell on a short-term deal, and I think you're starting to read that, that he's still in play. So I love this signing for both sides. It's right up there with the Nola signing. We talked to Aaron Nola the other day that Aaron Nola – Fitz is a Philly, and Zach Wheeler just looks good as a Philly. And the way he's pitched, man, he deserves every dollar he's got from them. And good for him. He's secure. It's probably be his last contract. Uh, but the Phillies are happy. He's happy. And like we talked about with Nola, they could basically have the same team for the next few years again. He keeps getting better, too. He adds the sweeper last year. And the sweeper, I was looking at at the um, the, the length of, of the horizontal sweep to it. I mean, it was it was about 10 inches at the beginning of the season. By the end of the season, you're getting 16 inches of horizontal seven, break on that. 17, he hit. 17? It got up to 17. I think he averaged. I think he averaged 15 point something. Dude, he keeps getting better. It's it's a great <laughs> fastball. It's elite command. It's three breakers. It's a gold glove this uh, past season. 192 innings. If AJ's still listening, that matters. Regular season. Then he's been pitching a ton in the postseason the past two years. And on top of everything else. The Phillies' defense has not been great. He's had some tough defense behind him. Even last year, the defense was in. Like, you look at some of the expected stats for him, and they're much better than the actual stats. Again, this is just a guy that fits here, not to mention a ballpark that is more hitter-friendly. And Zach Wheeler has looked like a top, whatever you want to call it, three-pitcher in Major League Baseball over the last three, four years. He is a total bargain. 
but total bargain. I mean, I don't know how to exactly calculate it, but he's probably worth like $50 million a year. And they got that in the first two years of the contract. That was, it was incredible, especially since he turned down the White Sox, who, if you remember back at that point, they were pushing it. They were, you know, they had those playoff appearances, the blackout at the stadium, like they, that was, that was their time. So that would have been their first hundred million dollar contract. He turned them down. Well done. Well, let's bring in a current player analyst to help us on this one. Then we'll get into his life as a nap. Patrick Corbin joining us right now, who went through the free agent dance years back. Patrick, great to have you on, dude. And if you don't mind, I'll just bring you right into the combo we're having because the breaking news today was Zach Wheeler. So first off, how you doing? I haven't seen you in a minute. And what did you think of that news if you haven't caught it yet? Yeah, I mean, guys all saw it this morning, but uh, good for him. He's been one of the best pitchers the last couple of years in the game. And um, we get to see him a lot in the same division. So um happy for him i'm sorry for our hitters i have to face them a lot more but um, um you're not that not. sorry <laughs> well, i mean i'm glad we don't have to hit anymore as well so okay that's fair that's fair you, you walked you did the dance you did the free agent dance and you ended up here in washington you got a, yeah. you did okay for yourself right i mean um yeah i know the the process can be different for a lot of people for me um we just got married um like a week before that. And then we took a trip out, uh, went to New York, Philly and DC and, um, ended up settling here. So, um, for me, it was a, was a great experience and, um, uh, got wine and dine for a little bit. And, um, but yeah, um, always, I've enjoyed my time here. Um, obviously in 2019, my first year and, and what we did then was uh, very special. I was going to say, you picked the right place, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you got that ring the first year, right? That had to be, I mean, that was like, ultimately you just got married. So you got two rings in less than yeah, a year. Yeah. So we, a um, uh, big reason why I did come here was because of Scherzer and um, Strasburg. Um, to, to be a part of that rotation was something that I wanted to do and um, knew about some of the other players um, that, that were here. And, and Soto, um, hearing his name a lot, um, um, and that was his first year that he stepped in. So just the, the core group of that team was, was awesome and uh, wish we got to keep it going. Obviously, the COVID and the lockout and stuff, but um, – Something I'll always remember. There's so much in that um, that's running through my head. You you said New York, Philly, and Washington. How close were you to signing in Philly and New York? And looking back at it, where do you think that? Where do you think those those would have taken your your career on a different trajectory? Obviously, you guys won the World Series. Epic. Yeah. You know that's uh, the Mount Rushmore. I mean, I grew up a Yankee fan, so obviously that would have been um, from upstate New York, and um, pretty much every, all the all my friends' family grew up Yankee fans, so that could have been something special. But um, had had three great offers from three great organizations, and um, the big thing was Scherzer and Strasburg to be a part of that rotation. And um, pitching is 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 very important, especially starting pitching, and um, to be able to be alongside those guys was was one of the main reasons why I um, decided to come here. When you, you guys won in 19, then obviously 2020 was the COVID year. Everything was shut down. I know when we won in 05, the next year in 06 was like, it was almost like a full year of like a celebration tour, right? Do you guys feel at all like you got a little bit gypped? Because um, you didn't yeah. get to, you didn't get to do like the rings in front of it. You know what I mean? Like everything where they bring everyone in and they do all these cool things. And you get to do all these cool things at the ballpark. I mean, that was like the best part. I mean, yeah, winning, obviously. But then the next year, everywhere you go, there's a million more fans. And then you guys had the 2020 mm-hmm. COVID year. Yeah, we were doing Zoom calls. I think they wanted to give us our rings on a Zoom call. And and, and we kind of felt, <laughs> um, I mean, no one really knew the best way to do it. So we, we waited to do it as a team when, when we eventually started back up. But yeah. Um, definitely wasn't normal um I, I think for the fans too to not experience that and obviously for the players to go out there the next opening day and um see see the banner and see those things um i'll tell you this after the world series we did have a fun week with the with the the parade and the white house and all the all the other things that came along with that we got to go to the hockey game and um do some pretty cool things there but um yeah, I don't know. Hopefully, have a chance to do it again yeah. and have have it be normal. So, are you a hockey guy though? Um, Being upstate that, New York? after that night was that that was a fun night. I don't know if the the photo of us on the Zamboni, we took our shirts oh, off, yeah. so that was pretty crazy. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you kind of felt like the week you could do whatever you wanted, and uh, nothing was going to happen. So, agreed. That's yeah. AJ AJ knows You're, he's blushing behind his sunglasses. There's their celebration. Everybody's celebration. 
when you sign a co- when somebody signs a contract like you signed, the question is, what is a successful six years in Washington? One World Series, two. Some teams, oh, the six years, if we just make the playoffs, back to relevancy. Was this a successful contract for you when you're done with it after this season? I think everyone's goal is to win the World Series every year, and, and only one team gets to do it. Um, was fortunate to do it our first year. Um, a couple years there in the middle of that weren't um, ideal, but um, I think there's been some highs and some lows. You try to learn from those and try to get better. Um, I think the last couple of years have been a little frustrating personally, and I'm um, just trying to find ways to get better. So I'm um, trying to maybe add a pitch or two here, but I still feel good. I'm still as confident as ever to go out there and, and pitch. But, um, I mean, for me, I, I just want to take the ball every fifth day, go out there and um, and try to do my best. And um, I think from my first year to now, we're a lot younger, obviously. And I think just being there and trying to show these guys um, how to how to go through a full season is, is, is what I'm trying to do. Do a pitch? Um, new pitch, what yeah, like going split, uh, cutter, knuckleball, what uh, we cutter going? now. So, what, what are your um, slider like? Kind of a cuttery, uh, slidery, slutter? Um, I think they call it the gyro. I'm learning all these numbers uh, too now, so I'm um, definitely new to that. But, um, just trying to throw something uh, a little bit harder, um, with some cut to it to, um, to help out. So, had some success so far in, in, in camp. So, um, continue to go from there. So you mentioned Strasburg and, and Scherzer. Do you still keep in touch with those guys? Yeah, I see um, uh, Max is down here. Um, so You're a crusty guy too? To uh, I just come here. Uh, um, okay. I, I, we bought a house here uh, when I signed, and um, I just come here and work out and um, do everything with the guys here, so it's great. But um, I don't see – Strauss is up in D.C., so I don't see him as, as, as much um, in the off season. But, um, but yeah, Max, Max is here a bunch, and obviously he's a fan favorite up in D.C. Yeah, I mean, when you do you guys face him when he was at the Mets? Or were you like, this is good? Because, like, whenever you face old teammates, did you guys match up and you were like, this is, this I, is um, a little awkward? I faced him. I got the pitch, and the bullpens there in New York are next to each other, yeah. and he runs his poles, and he just had that mean mug face, didn't even want to look at me. And I was like, all right. And then uh, we beat him that day. So that was kind of <laughs> right. uh, pretty yeah. good. So. Don't, yeah, because when he pitches, right, you don't look at him, you don't talk oh, yeah, to yeah, him. Yeah, 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 for sure. And yeah, so you didn't sure. walk by him and just you see his opposing pitcher. You should have walked by him, just like slapped him on the ass, and like, <laughs> yeah. What's up, Max? How are we doing today? Yeah. And just, Aah! oh yeah. Um, I mean, all the other days he's fine, but start day, everyone knows, uh, keep your distance, especially with him, and um, you'll be all right. All right, I like it. Is Strauss in camp? Is 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 Strasburg in camp? Uh, no, Strauss is not here. Uh, <laughs> I, wish, I wish he was. Uh, he's got a full locker listen, in there. He has a locker. He's had that for a while now. Uh, but um, obviously a very strange uh, situation there. Um, but everyone knows what Strauss did for this organization and, and what he's meant and um, was one of the best pitchers in the game for a long time. And obviously injuries happen. You hate to see it. And um, he's done everything he could to try to come back and just physically can't do it. So um, you feel for those guys and um, wish nothing but the best for him. You talked about your struggles. We look at your – as ex-players – and a huge fan of baseball. We look at what you've done. Yes, you've struggled, but you go out there and you make every one of your starts. What does that mean to you? Where'd you learn that? What do you think that means? Because I think that's a huge, every young guy that comes up and sees, you know what, this guy might not be pitching like he thinks he should be pitching, but he's making every one of his starts. And so so what is that? Talk about that for a little while. Yeah, I mean, the... I, like I said, I've had I've had highs. We've we we won the World Series here, and I've had lows. And um, I try to stay as even keel as I can. This is a, a very tough game. Um, you can do everything right and still fail. So you try to just um, teach these to some of these younger guys here that go out there. You compete. Just do what you can control, and um, and and the rest is made. So you just. Um, I don't know those games where you get beat up a little bit you learn from those and you try to come back and get better and um, I think this team and this rotation has done a good job with that getting their stuff done in between and um, I think we may have used seven or eight starters last season which I feel is pretty good for teams now to go a whole whole season and, and use that few of starters so um, just a credit to, to, to those guys and the staff making sure we're out there every fifth day and um, that's my goal every season make 30 plus starts and uh, pitch as deep as I can in each ball game whether things are going well or, or not okay so it was it was last year right where you struggled early so last year Owen when you started out like Owen 
seven zero and ten. Uh, maybe a couple uh, years. Yeah, a win loss record here. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. But I'm just saying. No, it was, um, but no, it was more yeah. about the struggles because then you bounce back. And you had a terrific second half after that. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so I, for you, how do you get through that? Because as a player, there's always there comes a point in time as a player where you're like, if I lost it. So like in your mind, things start spiraling, right? But you never, I mean, you took the ball, like Eric said, you took the ball every fifth day. You went out there and you pitched and you competed and you did the bit. And then all of a sudden it turned and then you were like, okay, this is the Patrick Corbin. So how, how mentally did you get through that? And then what can you show some of these young guys like Mackenzie Gore, like Josiah Gray, like some of these young guys that you guys have on this staff, what can you teach them from that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, may, maybe just the kind of the way that I have handled myself after some of those games. I mean, they see it firsthand after after a game, you give up five runs in the first and you try to battle through and try to work through six. And um, I think just the way that they see how you how you represent yourself after that and um, hopefully can can. Uh, they can pick some of those things off of me, but, um, and, and also those games where you do have success. Um, I mean, you've, you've, you've gone through it. There's, there's highs, there's more lows for most people. And, um, it's, it's a tough game. And I think, um, sometimes when you're just watching on TV, people don't really realize everything that's going on day in and day out. So, um, these guys get their work done and try to go out there and, um, and be the best that they can. And, um, and, and we've had a young team over the last couple of years. There's there's other things that factor in as well, but you just try to do what you can control and go from there. What was the one thing that you look uh, – that you could, like, re rely on? Like, is there one thought or one thing? Was it your routine? Was it like, okay, I know, you know, when I step Shit's in, going wrong right now, but I can, I, I know I can do this right. Yeah. I mean, when I step in between the line, that's why I still do this. The competition part I love and being able to go out there, compete against somebody and, and, um, they're, they're trying their best. You're doing your best and, um, trying to go out there. But, um, for me, that's the, the biggest part. That's why I still want to continue to do this and, um, and be around the guys and try to, um, talk to them or, or answer any questions that they may have, um, a lot of them are, are, are fairly new in, in the big league. So um, you try to do whatever you can to help them as well. Hey, Patrick, as the big fan here, um, the starting pitching marquee or whatever you see digitally, if you look it up on MLB.com matters a ton, right? It's the big selling point. So for me, for example, if I'm looking at the late night slate of games and there's four games, if I see Luis Castillo against Justin Verlander, I'm probably going to spend more time on that one. So the point I'm trying to get to is based off them saying you're making all your starts, you know, you've pitched with some of the biggest names too in baseball alongside you. How do we keep that going? Because we have less and less of that now. And it goes even beyond the bullpen games. It's just guys not trained to go as deep into starts. It's also front offices saying third time through. Like how, what do we do, whether it's a rule change or something else? Because the answer is not, oh, well, let's just get, you know, kids to try and take a little off the fastball and let's not rely on the radar gun. Like that's over. That's a part of the game. We're not going to be able to reverse that. So how do we keep this going? Because from the marketing side of baseball, I think it's a must and it's disintegrating. Yeah, I think, I mean, a lot of these relievers now, they all throw a hundred and, and it's, it's very enticing for these managers to say, Hey, that your starters getting up to 80, 90 pitches and bring in some of these other guys. But I think at the end of the day, it's 162 game regular season. And I think starting pitching is the most important thing to be a, be able to go out there, whether it's an extra inning, an extra out or two to, to save these arms. And not every day you're going to have your, your, your closer, your, your setup guy at hundred percent. So if you can eat up those innings, I think it helps. So hopefully more and more teams value that and continue to push towards that. But, um, I mean, I, I, I want to be around that 100 pitch mark or, or more, um, try to get as many outs as I can um, each and every day and, um, and and try to help the team down the road. Who's the rival in the East? Who's y'all's rival? Um, I don't know. I would guess I would I would I would have said the Mets a couple of years. I mean, every year it kind of changes. I mean, the Braves, I think, are 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 the standard in this division right now. They've they've I think won it seven straight years. Um, and I think I mean, they have all the bragging rights. They're the team on top. They're the one everyone's looking at. Everyone knows the lineup and, and roster that they have and how good that they are. So um, we, we are a young team here that I think uh, proved to, proved some people wrong last year. I think some of these other guys are going to step up this season, and um, maybe we don't have the, the big names yet here, but um, hopefully the future uh, we do. I've been told you got a, a pretty good name, you know, nearby, maybe five, five, ten feet away. So we'll we'll bring them in. You got a question for us to ask Josiah Gray that'll make him blush before we let you go? Uh, 
Um, I don't know. He is. Yeah, he's right there. I'm not sure. Uh, I think he'll answer anything <laughs> for you, though. <laughs> okay, hey, hold fine. on. What? Before, before we let Patrick go, were you in on the uh, baseball card thingy in there? Um, yeah, I just I just started getting into that. Uh, just probably the last two days, they made me download some app, and we got a card. So they got a uh, a one on one Bobby Witt and an Otani. So what'd you get? Um, though? A Brock Purdy. A football card. Yeah, I don't know. Oh. I, did, I they just said to do this one, and and I and I did it. So I actually had Trout. <laughs> Trout was texting me. I guess he sent me the screenshot of the. Uh, uh, someone tweeted out what was going on, and I I didn't know he was big in the cards and. Um, I guess he said they were good cards, so we'll see what happens with them. I don't know what you do now. Do you sell them or what? So, well, Lane Thomas said he's keeping his Otani signature, and it's like a one of fifteen. So I agree. I I would keep that for a while as a good investment. So we'll see what yeah. happens, but we'll follow it. I like that. More of that stuff's cool. We told Bobby. We told Lane to call Bobby Witt, DM him, uh-huh. and he'll because he said on our show that he'll buy all his cards. Uh-huh. So if you got a, a one of one, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, he just signed a small extension. So yeah. I'm thinking like. Mm-hmm. Mm, 287 Matt players have a little side hustle i like it i like it patrick good to see you man have fun the rest of camp and good luck this season dude all right thanks guys thank you thank you patrick yeah, corbin sure. with us we'll kick it back here with kratz and me just for a quick shift change and then we're going to talk to josiah gray but um you knew where i was getting at with the starting pitching marquee yeah. it's just like a marketing conundrum because when you look at a name it makes you want to attend the ballpark. It makes you want to watch that game, right? And I think I'm a good case study for that because I'm going to watch as many games as possible, but my eyes are veering off towards certain games. It's it's beyond bullpen games. It's just certain names that you see where you're like, eh, he's not going to pitch that deep into this one. You just you don't develop a storyline. No, I, no I, I hear what you're saying, and you want – that's what we want. You want people to click on your game. Yeah. You want people – we're not changing channels. You know, oh, who's throwing? Uh, Smith versus Hernandez. Not sure. Yeah. Oh, two bulk guys. Okay. Or, uh, you know what? They're on their sixth day. Now we don't have the five, you know, the five guys rotation. Okay, I'll just go to the Yankees. I'll go to the Dodgers. I'll go to the – and so it's a case of what what gets you more money for your org, but what gives you more money for baseball, more clicks. And to me, it's one and the same. Mm-hmm. You develop a guy like Patrick Corbin. Yes, he, they didn't think they were going to get what they got out of Patrick Corbin, but they won a World Series. The, he has made every one of his starts for the last seven seasons. That is so important. And if everybody does that in the game, if you start coming up through the minor leagues and doing that, to me, it adds so much more, so much more value. Also, I just want to say, because I know there was some chatter and I was involved in it in the chat, you know, during our conversation with Patrick, they don't win the World Series without him. Absolutely not. Period. Go He's back to pro. 2019. Period. So you don't have to worry too much about everyone else's wallet, especially the owners of teams. They won a World Series. If you take that player away, they don't. So if you're a true fan of the game, you take that trade any freaking day of the week. Strasburg contract, different story. We can talk about that, like the contract after, but same thing. Strass during that time period wins you a World Series. Hopefully they win another. Um, Josiah Gray would be part of that next group. So let's go back out to spring training in Florida. Yep. Nats camp, AJ, with Josiah. Josiah, good to see you, dude. It, it, was, it felt like yesterday we saw you in Vegas, and now here you are at camp. So what's going yep. on? And is this team about to shock the world during the regular season? I think we are, but things are good. You know, camp has been really good. A lot of guys are coming out hot, coming out strong. Uh, you know, it's been a lot of fun learning from, you know, the guys that have been here and the new guys. It's been, you know, really good vibes, and we're looking forward to, you know, a big year. Hey, Crouchy, I already asked him. I said, hey, when are you pitching? He said, Friday. So I just pitched. I said, uh, against two. He said, Boston. And I said, where? And he said, Fort Myers. And we were like, oh, yeah. get them gray pants ready. And that's a <laughs> long-ass drive. You couldn't have got the backfield like against uh, the triple A? Come on. Their minor, our minor league didn't start their camp yet, so oh. I was like, I'll body it. So I drove the night before, pitched, and then drove right back. So oh. still feeling it a bit. That, is, all good. that um, is a grind. I mean, hey, with the last name Gray, I guess you always have Gray in your locker. <laughs> Look at it right here. Yeah, Look, got, oh, yeah. I like these, by the way. Every team has these. That is nice. Mm-hmm. You guys got to get one. Get the Are they see-through? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Only his pants. 
That's why I had to pitch on the road, he said. Oh, I love it. <laughs> the Grays hey, are less. Out. So, so Josiah, um, we, we, we spoke a little bit about Cruz and Wood and would love to get your thoughts on those two as well. But anyone else pitching-wise on the really super young side that's not up with the ball club yet that we should be circling? Yeah, honestly, it's easy to talk about Cruz and Wood just because of the way they approach the game, the way their bats are going, and, you know, the way they kind of stand out. But on the pitching side, you know, I think Cole Henry's had a really good camp. Uh, Mitchell Parker, um, these are two guys that, you know, I haven't really um, known up until camp started. And, you know, they're going out there throwing the sixth and seventh innings, not the greatest of, you know, conditions, and they're doing their job. So I'm really excited for those guys. And, you know, they've been looking really, really good. And, um, you know, everyone's positive. Everyone's, you know, have a, has a good, uh, you know, vibe to them, and we're looking forward to it. Question for you. I mean, we were joking about it earlier, but it, here's the way I'm going to script. I'm not going to get into the see-through pants and the whole deal. We, we had the marketing conversation, you know, a few months back in Vegas. Here, here's one of my gripes for marketing. Why are we making names on the back smaller? And I know it's about the the name on the front, the logo on the front, but we all know, and you're good on this, that more people need to know about our game, and I think we're hitting another renaissance period. Shouldn't we have, like, jumbo-sized names on the back, <laughs> everything looking super big? Plus, I'm watching on my phone. I can't see anything if it's too small. Yeah, yeah. honestly, um, that was one of the first things that stood out was the the name or the size of the names. Um, I always thought they were good, and, you know, this year they're a lot smaller, so I'm not sure what – went into that decision but you know i'm not picky about it but i know a lot of guys have been you know not happy with uh, the quality and how the jerseys look and you know it's going to be interesting to see you know what changes are made you know here in the in the short window that we have before the season starts i, I watched you throw a bullpen well, well i mean watched i mean i was sitting here and you were throwing like i don't know 100 <laughs> feet over there so i kind of watched from the side but i mean you guys have what is it cameras or or a computer right behind you guys. So yeah. you guys analyze every pitch because I think you and Mackenzie Gore were throwing next to each other at the same time. Yeah. So there's one camera on both you guys and it analyzes every pitch you guys throw and then you go sit down and say, all right, well, this is what I saw and oh, I felt this and it's, that's every pitch. Exactly. So um, with the TrackMan units, you get the way the ball's, you know, spinning out of your hand and how it's perceived by the batter. So uh, for me, you know, in working on some pitches, you want to see, okay, this feel – got the result I was looking for. It got more break. It got more, you know, hop on the ball, whatever it may be. So, yeah, we look at that stuff, and it's kind of like that instant feedback, and uh, you can really make adjustments on the fly. So did you did you read the sign that Rizzo put up on the, on the screen? <laughs> it's not there. Dude, it's not there anymore. Yeah, it's yeah. taken down. I mean, you kind of have to – you have to understand. My perspective on that sign was, you know, why – if you're walking guys, you know, it doesn't matter how hard you throw, you know, be competitive in the, in the zone, you know, trust your stuff. So that's the way I interpreted was attack the hitters, you know, don't be so focused on, you know, everything like, oh, I got to blow this guy up, like attack the zone with your best stuff, get the hitters out. That's kind of how I've interpreted it. And um, it's been a positive result, I think, so far. Do you think do you think Twitter's got it wrong? Do you think Instagram's got it wrong? Like. Dudes that are just coming out and just grunting and throwing it as possibly hard as you can up against a, a black cinder black wall. I mean, I think there's part there's two parts to that, right? There's, you know, the off season where, you know, say a guy's training for velocity or training to, you know, get the most out of their mechanics. And that's obviously a part of the game that a lot of us have seen, you know, and then it's compete mode, you know, when there's a hitter in the box and you're in a big league game. You got to get the hitter out. So you can't, if, you know, that grunting and, you know, the full effort is how you get out, so be it. But if there's, you know, lacking parts of your games of where, you know, you're grunting every two pitches and they're, you know, halfway up the backstop, that's not conducive to getting out. So um, I think there's two parts to it. Do you, when you're throwing your bullpens and you have the track man, you have everything sitting out there, do you go pitch by pitch? Is it is it giving you live live like real time info? So you throw a pitch, mm -hmm. and you say they say okay ninety four point three this this axis of spin, this you know spin rate da 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 you know because now they can got to where they can even show kind of where your hand was on yeah, the ball yeah, right. Yeah, yep, yep, so yep. you're getting real time data. So real every time. pitch you throw, 
you're like, okay, now I just want to maybe turn my hand a little, you know, a degree to the left or to the right or whatever. Mm -hmm. So see, that's amazing to me that yeah. how much it's because it used to be you used to have the old pitching coach sitting back there watching. <laughs> Yeah, that was a good slider, Josiah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, people have those pens where you just want to feel good, right? And you don't want to worry about the data. But then there are obviously pens where, you know, you had an outing and the pitch wasn't where you wanted it to be. And you look and you're like, all right, I'm going to devote, you know, four or five pitches to this one thing, seeing if I can get, you know, the release or the break I want on it. And you go from there. So I think it's it's just another tool in the toolbox, honestly. Do you have do you have a new pitch you're working on? Because everyone seems to have a – like Corbin <laughs> just told us he's working on a cutter, right? Yeah. So do you have like a new trick pitch you're going to try? Um, you know, I want to keep things under wraps. Oh. But, um, yeah, I've honestly been focusing on – Terminator. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm focusing on uh, my breaking stuff and my sinker. Okay. Um, just trying to uh, make them a little bit more crisp. Uh, you know, the sweeper slider combo that uh, has people in, you know, up in arms as well. Um, so which one do you throw? Both. So you throw a sweeper and a slider? Yeah. So you throw more one that goes this way and more one that goes more down? More down. So working on that, separating the two. Um, and then the sinker, just getting more of that arm side movement that, you know, the, the guys with the quality sinkers have um, just to deepen the arsenal. Is that a different sign? It's um, like sweepers, like two and well, sliders. Well, well we use Pitchcom. Oh, that's we'll right. We use Pitchcom. So, so, so Ruiz is back there, and he's like, "Yeah, exactly. one a little more horizontal." So he's like, "Sweeper, <laughs> sweeper, sweeper, sweeper." And yeah. He's like, "This guy can't hit the down one." Slider, 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 yeah, slider. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly that. I mean, um, did you play with the? Pitchcom? No, no, no. I'm, I'm too um, old for that. I, I, I believe in like actually putting my fingers down there and giving you. I was, oh. I was the same way. And then we had a start in uh, 2022. We're playing the Angels. And they're like, hey, give it a try. If you don't like it, scrap it. And from that point on, I have that's I can't see me going back. Okay. I, I, listen, I'm I, all for, it speeds up the game. It does. And you know what else? You know what you should really do? Because as a former catcher, Kratz yeah. will tell you this. You need to put one, like, on your, on your belt or on yeah. your glove. Because that way, when you call the pitch oh, yeah. and it gets whacked, Catcher's like, it ain't my fault. It ain't, I didn't call that one. That was all him. Yeah, after a foul ball, you set it right up. Oh, yeah, it's it's been really good for the game, the pitch calm. And, pitch, game, um, pitch calm or pitch clock, though? Pitch calm, I'm a fan of. Pitch clock, it's quicker now. It even went faster on you guys. It's even faster now. So, so you out of breath every pitch now? No. But <laughs> <laughs> it's it like, look at me. I got it takes you a second. Like, honestly, like, it took me uh, last year when they implemented it. I was like, man, this is, like, so different. And you get used to it. But now you got to get used to it again a little quicker. So, yeah, you pitchers, man. You guys always got to have something to complain about. <laughs> oh, the balls weren't rubbed up properly. Oh, I, mean, I got to work too fast. <laughs> the balls are. The game. Kind of <laughs> That's for another day. That's for another day. <laughs> That's hey, hey, we need to, we need to hear all those gripes from you pitchers. Even though AJ's not gonna listen, we need to hear all the gripes. But I need to yeah. know you said the pitch com. The pitch com, if you got to choose any voice, whose voice would you want to be on the pitch com? Like who would make you make that pitch? Like would it be Davey? Would Davey be like slide? Oh man. Could well, it could it be anyone? Anyone. Anybody in the world. The um, UFC announcer, Bruce Buffer. Let's get it Bruce on! Buffer, pitch com. Yeah. What, what does he say? It's time. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. But not Michael Buffer, his brother. No. Let's get ready to rumble. No. Bruce Buffer, okay. 100% for 100 pitches. And I would do great, I think. Wait, this is doable though. What this is the happen. actual voice that, that goes in there? Is it just a bot? Because I mean, FT is yeah. kind of big enough that Bruce Buffer will probably respond to this if we post this somewhere. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you can just make like it a, anyone's voice, though, can't you? Like yeah. you can record, like you can record yes. like anyone's voice. I, I, I think you can. I think oh. you can. Um, side, side gig for Bruce. Set Buffer. it up. He's not yeah, making it enough at UFC. He's going to be on your pitch. Yeah, call. it's just I mean, like, you it's just throw like him a couple robot. bucks, right? The Nats will. The Nats will throw him a couple bucks. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, we got it. We got it. We'll cover it. But wait, what do you hear right now, though? Like, what is the voice that you'll hear in your start? Like a simple robot voice. So, like, oh, basketball, we got to do better. Go outside. It's no. But I, think... I have one. If you guys want one, I have one. Yeah, you guys. I have one. In my, I have one. Yeah, we have it at my, my kids' high school. Humble brag. High school pitch come. 
Yeah, but I don't want to. Yeah, AI look at Josiah. Voice. Josiah's like, we didn't even have that in college. My <laughs> yeah, college right? wouldn't have had that. Fastball, slider, That's, inside I like move. I, like I mean, that. you can do all kinds yeah. of like picks and everything on it. Yeah, the game's changing. It is. All right, well, we'll work on that. Josiah, great to see you again, dude. Enjoy the rest of camp, and we're going to go bother your skipper, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, skipper's on the way. <laughs> yes, he is. Thank you, guys. Cheers, man. Good to talk to you. Absolutely. You too. Thank you, Josiah Gray, with us from Nats Camp. As uh, we'll flip it back here, and then we'll get to Davey Martinez. If anyone has questions for the manager of the Washington Nationals, drop them in the chat. I'll try to mix a few of those in there. We got a lot to get to with him. This is a young team, a team that's been going through the rebuild for a few seasons. But I have to say, it's not a team I've been very critical of because I think they've done a pretty nice job so far with their rebuild, even last year in the second half of the season. I mean, that's not a roster in my mind that was ready yet to compete. And they essentially did in the second half, Thought they did a lot of the little things. Well, they have two monster, monster outfield pro prospects in Dylan Cruz and James Wood both have a chance to be all-star caliber players on a yearly basis. I mean, the ceiling for each of them is superstar level, right? And you've got two guys like that. The floor is they're going to be good everyday big leaguers. You know, I mean, obviously I can't predict injuries and all of that, but there's two guys that are ready to come up this season in my mind, and we'll get exact dates, or at least we'll press Davey to give us exact dates on when they're going to be in the bigs for good. But I mean, that makes a huge difference on offense for this team. Obviously, we're trying to start to learn some more names for them on the pitching front. They're not there yet. You know, they're still probably at least a year or so away from contending. And I will give you my complaint. I do want to see some offseason moves, you know, I get it, I guess for this year, but starting next year, it's like, let's open up the book again and let's get, get after it. Cause that's how they won a world series. The Max Scherzer contract was one of the better free agent pitching contracts that we've seen. Ever. Just like we mentioned with Wheeler. It, it's, it's an ever contract. One of the best ever, mm -hmm. but they're still kind of paying for that world series. They're still paying Scherzer for a few more years yet. They're still paying Strasburg. You know, that didn't work out with the injuries. That's, unlucky but they won the world series that is the biggest thing and and nobody really expected them to win that world series but to me and maybe i'm just kissing up because he's coming onto the show <laughs> he's listening to you but i think there are certain managers in the game that get the most out of what they're given and i saw you saw that in florida you saw that in milwaukee you saw that last year with the nats in their second half like you create an environment that players that come up whatever you don't get james woods every day you don't get james wood coming through the door every time you get a call up that's just the reality of life mm -hmm. but you create an environment and now you go james wood you go dylan cruz cj abrams takes another step you've already locked up kybert ruiz i will always forever talk about up the middle mm -hmm. you got to go through and you got to get some pitching and they are not set but it, it looks really promising straight through the middle of the field. Well, let's intro him. Let's ask about it right now. Manager Davey Martinez joining us I from think guys camp. Talking about Joe Madden. <laughs> hey, Joe, uh, Joe Madden. Is no, he no, coming no. on? Is Joe coming on? I thought he was going to come on. Davey was going to bring Joe on. Hey. Uh, <laughs> hey, that's, he's always on my mind. That's my mentor. <laughs> he, he, la he laughs at me every time I do something dumb. <laughs> that's a good mentor. Yeah. He's like, I didn't teach yeah, you that. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, David, so good to see you. And before we get into it, uh, sorry, AJ, I'm just curious because we're obviously going to move on to your team. Do you think Joe should have a job right now? Because we've had him on a couple times on the show and he was like, yo, call me. I want to manage again and I think I would do a great job. Yeah, he's a, he's unbelievable. man. like I said, he, he, he was my mentor for many, many years. I learned a lot from him. The biggest thing I learned is one to be my be myself and, you know, and and, uh, and uh, it's a process, you know, and stick to the process. So um but he's, he was great, man. This guy, you talk about somebody that really thought out, outside the box um, but had a plan, and um, he did that every day. All right, so how's camp? Let's, let, let's get down to the nitty-gritty now. Like, how's camp going? You got yeah. rained out yesterday, so you got a sim game going on the backfield. Yeah, we, right? got, we got a lot going on today, but camp's been awesome. I, I mean, know. I walked know. by your door earlier. I went to use the bathroom, <laughs> and it was closed, and I saw Jim Hickey, your pitching coach, and he's like, you want to talk to Skip? And I'm like, door's closed. That's never a good sign, no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right no, we, we were just going over scheduling and stuff for the next couple of days, but um, it's been awesome. You know, we got a mix of unbelievable uh, uh, guys here, from the young to, to veteran guys, and um, it's been great. Who, all right, so I'm going to ask straight up. Who's better, Cruz or Wood? Oh, man. Toss-up. 
toss up. Ah, uh, both good. So no, no, you gotta, you gotta choose. He's not going to. They, they're both, they're both really good. They're both. I can right, Let's put it this way. I can't wait to get them both. <laughs> All right. So when will we see them? This year? Oh, good possibility. It's a good possibility. Yeah. Is there I mean, a chance? Okay, and you won't. I know you're not going to answer, but I'm going to ask you anyways. Is there a chance we see him break camp with you guys? Either one of them. Pro- uh, yeah. yeah. If it was up to me, good possibility. Um, but you know that's for the hire. Uh, but you know they still they're still learning a lot a lot about um uh, the process and how to how to play up here and how to be consistent up here. That's the biggest biggest thing for some of these young guys. And we saw with with CJ last year and, and K Bear, you know, the last two and a half months of the season, um, they started putting it together. And I think I think you just saw uh, surface scratch with those guys. I mean, those guys are going to get better. Um, they're starting to understand who they are. Um, and they both did really well the second half. So we got to build all, off of that, and I want these guys to get off to a good start. Hey, by the way, did you ask Dylan Cruz? I know he was like the, what, second overall pick, how much of a pay cut he took to come to Washington <laughs> from LSU? Hey, I don't want to know. I want to know how much he's going to make for us. That's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> what, does the, what do the higher-ups, because you're already convinced, what do the higher-ups need to see from James Wood? I mean, I, I, spring training numbers – we're not even going to get into that. What do they need to see? Like, hey, do they tip the clubhouse guys well enough? Or what, what do they need to see? Hey, we just, like I said, you know, we, you know, throughout his, uh, you know, he, ch- he chases quite a bit, you know, so we're trying to get him to chase less. Uh, when he puts the ball play, obviously he hits the ball really hard. Um, I know Darnell's working with him. Uh, Chris Johnson's working with him about maybe getting the ball up with two strikes. Change, change the way he thinks. I mean, because he swings, you know, he swings hard all the time and, you know, with two strikes, guy, especially with guys in scoring position, it's about driving in that run. You know, uh, we do believe that. So, um, but he's done. He's done a lot better this spring. He's starting to understand. You know, hey, I got to get the ball up with two strikes. They're going to try to bury breaking balls, change us down, down in the zone. So he wants to see the ball up, and he's done a way better job so far. So, hey, you know, the biggest thing is to get him out there every day, get him playing every day. Um, and as we say, these these things work themselves out. I mean. He's going to be a national, you know, and um, whether it's uh, when we break camp or a month from now or who knows when, but he's definitely going to be a national. What's – Davey, how – oh, go ahead, AJ. Oh, no, so I was going to say what – because you mentioned we talked about C.J. Abrams and he kind of started to take the next step, right? Well, what's the next step for C- for a guy like C.J. Abrams? Lane Thomas took that next step for you guys last year, right? So now C.J. Abrams seems like – and Kyber Ruiz is, is – Right there, kind of, they're kind of with CJ together, right? So, what's the next step for not only CJ but probably Ruiz, and before you get to then kind of the next wave, which is a Cruz and a Wood. Yeah. So the biggest thing for CJ is consistency. Now, you know, you saw what he can do. Um, now it's just to be consistent every day. Uh, you know, just you know, not only hitting but on the field. You know, making better throws to first base. Last year, we, we you know, I, I think we had Dom Smith, and uh, he, I mean, he was unbelievable. He should have won a Gold Glove. It was all early on in the season. Our throwing wasn't very good. Uh, CJ has some throwing issues, um, and he cleaned all that up. You know, he, he, Ricky Gutierrez, he's been working with. He worked with him all last year, um, and now he's standing his legs a lot better. He's getting to the ball a lot quicker, um, and his throws have been really crisp over there. So that's awesome, you know. So now it's just about um, being consistent, you know, and and, uh, and I think last year he's got a little bit more confidence because he did what he did. Um, so And he's been a different cat this spring. He really has. Um more of a quiet leader. I mean, really, I mean, he's, he's going about his business, getting his work done. Um, he's having some good at-bats in spring training, not do, trying to do a whole lot, but hitting the ball hard. Um, and he's getting on base, and he, you know, he, he knows, you know, as I told him last year, you know, your, your job is to get to third base with less than two outs. Um, and, you, I mean, you got the leeway to do, to go, uh, unless I, unless I, I deem something else. But um, he took it to heart, and, man, he, he was unbelievable the second half of the season last year. What, what is your motivation as, as a manager? You guys won a World Series. Now you're, I don't want to say the word rebuild because I think you guys have done an incredible job. And I don't know if you were on before. I said, hey, you know, I think managers get the most out of their players. And you guys clearly did that with a roster that maybe wasn't built to win last year. And you guys still won. What is your motivation as a manager? You know, want us to want us to win another championship, really, and I and I believe yeah, that. Don't I, get greedy. And hey, you can't have them all. I want them all. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know that that's the ultimate goal. But to do it with this 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 core, this group, I mean, um, yeah, we started. We, you know, basically started over. Um, you can't repeat what we did in '19 uh, because most of those guys are gone, and they, a lot of those guys were veterans. But to be able to uh, to develop these kids. 
and watch them grow and watch their growth throughout. Um, it means a lot to me. And, uh, you know, everybody knows I'm very passionate about the game, you know, as a coach, but also as a player, um, I love the game, you know, and I want these guys to understand that, Hey, that, you know, this is a livelihood. You know, this is a brotherhood as I can sit here with AJ, you know, who's passionate about the game as well. Um, you gotta be passionate about it. You know, you got, when you step on that field, Hey, you're playing for 25 other guys on your team. Uh, you're playing for your fans. You're playing for, for whatever you want to play for your family, but you got to go out there and leave it on the line. I, I tell these guys all the time, Hey, by the end of the game, I'm exhausted mentally. By the end of the game, I want you guys to be physically and mentally exhausted. That, that, that means that, hey, you're putting it all on the line every day. That pumps me up. AJ, I think we're on the same page here on that front because I think you can provide a unique perspective on this, okay? This is a guy that you managed that helped you win a World Series. Is Anthony Rendon misunderstood? And have you communicated with him over the last couple of years? Because he's been going through it. So I'd love to get your perspective. Yeah, I talked to him. I talked to him last year. Look, he was... He was awesome for me. I mean, I, I have no complaints of him, man. He uh, he went out there every single day. I wrote his name in the lineup, and he played and, and, and did really unbelievable things. We don't win without him, um, but he's a quiet guy. You know, he's going to lead by just going out there and playing the game. Get you know, I, w- I would never ask him to do a whole lot, just go play. Uh, I think he respected that. I talked to him last year. We went and played him. I said, hey, you be you, man. That's all I can tell you. You be you, but hey. You know, when you step on that field, I, you know, I always knew what I was going to get from him. Did you, did you, did Wash call you? So I, talk, when, I talked to Wash. When Wash, bit, when uh, Wash got that job, because that was, we had Wash on here, and that was one of the questions. That was, and he's like, I'm flying to Houston tomorrow, I think he said, to, yeah. to go talk to Anthony and see where he's at. And I've seen he's been playing a lot in spring training. So, but then the quotes came out that, you know, uh, you know, yeah, no, whatever, I, which is fine. Everyone has the right to say right. whatever they want. But you see, you spoke to Wash and said, hey, this is how he was with me. Yeah. This is what you can expect. And, and this Absolutely. is a good dude. Absolutely. He asked me in um, he asked me in the winter meetings and I told him, I said, hey, write his name. You know, let him be. Write his name out in the lineup. He's going to give you everything he's got that day. And I'm not granted. He's been through some injuries, which I know was tough for him. Um, but if he's healthy, um, he, he'll put up some big numbers for you. Did you see the uh... – Zach Wheeler contract extension today. And I ask you about that because we mentioned it earlier. Max Scherzer was one of the best free agent contracts we've seen. Speaking of another guy who, if he isn't here and doesn't sign a deal like that, you don't have a banner hanging. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, he's the best. You know, he's the best. Uh, um, I had two of those guys that took the ball every five days and were horses. Um, yeah, horses. Three. You throw Corbin in there, too. Well, Corbin, too. But those, you know. Uh, he's still here, so I don't consider him gone. <laughs> True. Uh, yeah. And he's still doing it. So, uh, but you know, Max was was awesome. You know, Steven Strasburg, um, I love him. The man, he what he meant to to me, this organization, uh, the fans. Uh, we miss him. We surely miss him. But um, you know, he's he's got some health issues. So, uh, um, but I, you know, for me, I just hope that he, he's able to live his life with his kids and and do the things he wants to do in the future. Have you guys talked about? Let's say maybe this year, hope you know, for your sake, hopefully this year, if not next year, or coming soon with all the kids we've talked about, right? You know, throwing Mackenzie Gore, you know, Josiah's Gray is a young guy. Corbin's still got a couple years left. Do you guys talk about like do you, do you feel free enough to call your ownership and say, hey, we're we're right in this thing at, and it's the All Star break. We need reinforcements. You you feel confident they're like, hey, we'll go get who you yeah. need, or even if not this year, in the off season next year. Say, hey, we need, a, a let's say, a starting pitcher. Right. They'll go out and get whoever the best. We need a first, I don't know, just random position, right. first baseman. Yeah, the fir- first things first, you know, they, they they finally said that they wanted to keep the team, which I think that's awesome. You know, uh, that, there's going to be some stability now. Uh, and they're in it. You know, they're in it. And I know that if, you know, if we're, we're in it, you know, they'll go out and try to get some help. Uh, and if we can continue to do, you know, progress th- this winter, we're going to look be looking for another, maybe another starting pitcher, another big bat. Uh, things that we we need um, to fit in with some of our young guys. So um, it's great news to know that they're keeping the team and they're gonna they're gonna try to help us in the future. So I'm excited about that. I got one more for you, Davey. How's Joey Gallo looking? Because this is another guy like all the tools comes in. You know, big fanfare, big prospect. Had some good times, and it's not like he's old, but he has lost it over time the last couple of years compared to what he used to be. You see any signs that he can kind of bring? some of that back from a few years ago? I do. I do. You know, one of the reasons why he's here, because I really feel like we can help him. Um, you know, obviously the guy still got power, you know, and he drives and runs. 
Uh, everybody says he had off year last year, but you look at his numbers, he still you know, knocked in 20 plus home runs and drove with some runs. So um, having him here, giving us giving us that, that pop in the middle of the line, is definitely going to help. Um, I know he's working with Darnell and, and CJ about how to really, uh, you know, put the ball in play for us a little bit more, cut down and strike, strike out a little bit, um, driving runs, you know, that, that he can, that, you know, we call them the freebies, as AJ would call them, probably, you know, driving those runs for us as well. But he's been great. I mean, he really has. And, um, man, he's been taking in the young kids and helping them. And uh, he's he's been a god since he's been here. Has, yeah, I hope he does well. Nice dude, good interview. And Davey, always great to catch up with you too. Dude. More, Appreciate the more. time. Yeah, AJ finished strong. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, 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 do That's not right. cut no, he AJ cuts off. me off. Don't cut AJ off. I don't, I don't tell know. him what to do. He knows that. You signed in August, right? You resigned a new contract. I'm not going to ask the terms. Now, are you mad that Craig Council signed for eight million? And I don't know what you signed no, for. Hey, I'm, are you like? Are you like calling? You like Rizzo? Hey, Mike. Uh, I don't know about if you know, but Craig Council just signed for hey, forty. Hey, the, he doesn't hey, have a World awesome. Series either. Just saying. <laughs> hey, if it's out there, go get it. That's right. <laughs> Good for him. Yeah. Hey, that raises the market. Davey's young. Right, He's a young right. manager. He'll, I don't he'll know, get man. He's, the market. Getting, I got, hey, He's starting to get gray, yeah, man. Gray, gray, right. I always say hey, this is a little bit of C.J. Abrams, just a little bit of Louis Garcia, a little bit of K. Bear Ruiz. <laughs> I am a catch in there too. <laughs> who gives you who gives you the most gray? Who gives you the most gray? You gotta be honest. We can't you couldn't choose who's uh, the best player. Who gives you the most gray? Hey, they're hey, I I, I call them all my knuckleheads, man. They're all my knuckleheads, yeah. I mean they're <laughs> one, all in there. One's man. more of a knucklehead. Huh? C- one's CJ, more of a knucklehead. I think, I think CJ's the one. You know, <laughs> okay, CJ. good, no, good. Hey, sometimes I look at him and go, hey, are, are you with us there? Are you not? What, what's going on here, yo? <laughs> I'm all in. Hey, all sometimes right. he gets on the base. He thinks he's invisible, right? Like he just can run oh, and no man, one can see him. He is invisible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he can roll. He can, he can roll. roll. There's no oh, doubt. He's that fast. I like it. Davey, good to see you, dude. Get back to your knuckleheads, man. <laughs> all right, brother. Thanks. Thank you. Dave Martinez, manager of the Washington Nationals, with us on FT. Yeah, that's true. CJ Abrams has a chance to steal 70 bases. If he puts together a full season and also gets on base a little bit more. And you remember, I mean, how young he is. Yeah, there are really good signs on the position player front for this team. My question will be how many young pitchers are coming through. And if that's not the case, you do have to head to the free agent market, which, hey, might be changing a little bit. I mean, you know, we're going to be right Chapman soon. Not yet. But, yeah, we're, Why we're not, not going to see the numbers, I'm saying, from, from necessarily Snell and Montgomery. Wheeler, now I get it, is off the market. But if you're a Nats fan – I think you want this team to get as close to 500 this year as possible if you're trying to be realistic, right? And then in the offseason, you want to see the team grab some pitching. The, the easier winning formula for a rebuilding ball club has been to draft and develop position players over pitchers. Obviously, you're drafting both and you're developing as best as you can. But if you click on four or five position players, you set yourself up differently. And pitching prospects are just tougher to predict. They are. You're going to miss on more pitching prospects. Injuries. So the more injuries, the, the winners and the teams that have lasted for a while on their rebuilds have done it tilted on the position player side. We're seeing that right now with Baltimore. We saw that with the Cubs when they won their World Series. Tigers it, are the adverse side of it. Tigers had. They went that route, and so far pitching. it hasn't worked. Same they had with the pitching, Royals. And, yep. The Angels went crazy the last couple of years with drafting pitchers, and still what emerges from their farm system? Mostly a few good position players. So far, pitching's been eh. So I'm just saying, I mean, even with the Astros, what put the Astros over the top was a Verlander acquisition. And they, they did kind of both, but it was still more tilted on the position player side. There was a point totally. where you looked at that roster and it's like Altuve, Correa, and Springer and go down the line, right? And it was still more on the position player side, Bregman, et cetera. 100%. And, but they were solid up the middle. Springer was, you know, they didn't have a catcher. They, they, they put a catcher in there. They found your Jason Castros. They found your Evan Gaddis. <laughs> they found your, you know, Martin Maldonado for years. So that was the not up the middle part. But Kiebert Ruiz, Kiebert is is a player. From talking to Kevin Franzen, who sees the team every single day, talks to this guy, loves what he does behind mm-hmm. the dish. And you see that kind of stuff day in and day out more than you do stats from a catcher. And I think it's something that they have that core up the middle, but free agency wise pitching just real quick, you got to almost look at it and be like, is Jordan Montgomery the guy that we want 
in this realm of pitcher because we're not going to go after Burns or Freed. Most likely, they both should. are three hundred plus million dollar pitchers, and we're still paying Strasburg, unfortunately, and we're still paying Scherzer. So if you get Monty this year, he can sustain you up through that next class of free agent pitchers. Yeah, that's a guy they should target. I agree with you. And we'll get to the Chapman signing soon. Let's get to our next guest back out at Nats camp. Not a Nats person, but a Hall of Famer. The president of the Hall of Fame. Josh Rawitz joining us. Well, you are. You're you're in the club right now because you're running the club. So, Josh, great to see you. And um, what are you up to? First off, you hop into different camps right now? I do. Yeah, it's pretty one of the fun parts of this gig is making my rounds around the Cactus League and Grapefruit League. So I just uh, wandered in on you guys this morning and uh, was kind enough to be asked to hang out with you all for a few minutes. So, yeah, just catching up with players and coaches and everybody else while I'm here. Well, thanks for the time and give us the number one complaint you get. Cause I'm sure sometimes people come up to you and they go, how come so-and-so is not in the hall? Or, you know, what are you <laughs> getting? Or maybe it's something they don't like up in Cooperstown. You got to be getting, you know, thrown all different directions from some of the baseball people that you talk to, right? Oh man. It's, it's, it is definitely a daily thing. Um, and it is always about who their guy is. That's not in. Um, actually I just had one a few minutes ago, um, where one of the, one of the trainers is asking me about Dr. Job and how Dr. How come Dr. Job isn't in the hall of fame and obviously created Tommy John surgery. And, uh, I got to know him very well at my time at the Dodgers, but he's not one of the people that is, that is an executive or a, a coach or a manager. So again, it, I mean, it's, that's probably it. Everybody's got their strong opinions on the hall and that's what makes it such a cool place is everybody's got an opinion. Yeah, I asked him earlier. You guys missed it. I was like, hey, uh, how come I didn't get only got two votes for the Hall of Fame? I'm like, I think there was a conspiracy theory against me. And he, he said there was. So at least I know the truth. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thank you for being yeah. honest. Yes, exactly. <laughs> truth That's comes out. Here and, uh, yeah, exactly. What, 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 what's it like? Because I, I know Shesta, who works for you, who was with the Red Sox with me. Like, what's it like? You were in Arizona, right? And then you go from Arizona – to Cooperstown like that is a culture shock right it, it was um I'm going on year three so now it feels like home it's actually uh, it's an amazing place to live and work actually frankly one of the things I keep trying to get people to understand like people in the game don't think of Cooperstown as a place they might want to work we all think about other teams maybe but you don't necessarily think about Cooperstown it's amazing I mean yes it's colder yes it's smaller um but it's just you walk in every day to baseball heaven, and um, it's it's working in the game. It's it's being in the game without the game schedule. So that certainly is, has been a nice adjustment. But um, I just I, there's no way to put into words. If you haven't visited, it's such a cool place to go and visit. And um, got an amazing team. There's a like hundred full time people. Shest is a rock star. Everybody in baseball knows him. Um, but yeah, I feel very very lucky that this this landed on me as, as an opportunity. I'm, listen, I've been to Cooperstown many times, and. Uh... It's one of the coolest places on earth. If you're a baseball fan, you haven't been. Do you get like lifetime pass or like the Oda Saga? You know, do you do they give you like a big house on the lake where you get to live? You know, because that lake is awesome. Now, not in the winter, but in the summer. Yeah. You know, a pontoon boat to go out there and you know mess around on the big lake there. That's, I think most people don't even realize we we do have a ten mile lake right there. Yeah. It's Part of your life. It's almost I don't want to say I live in Chicago, but like life in Chicago is around the lake. Life around Cooperstown is on the lake. Um, so no, I do not get a house on the lake, but we did buy a place that's not that's pretty close. Uh, so we got a great spot there. Um, and it's just uh, the Otisaga, if you haven't if you haven't gone there. I mean the hotel's 120 years old and, and really just one of the coolest places. Overlooks the lake. It's got an unbelievable veranda and it's got a great restaurant that we eat at numerous times a week. <laughs> it's right across the street from my house, actually. <laughs> oh. It's a good spot. You didn't buy the little green one. I did not. There I was a little a green one, one kind of, okay, because no, when I went one. up there for Frank's thing, okay, we stayed at like a little green one. It was like right across the street. There was like a little stream that ran along. So it'd be I know exactly the what you're talking about. Had a nice porch. No, we are, uh, but my house used to be a bed and breakfast in Cooperstown, a lot of places. Ah. So people have stayed, in fact, in my house over the years. Who's the Who's the one Hall of Famer that you kind of, you kind of blushed. You kind of were starstruck when you first met him. Um, you know, it's, the, be- the best way to answer that is I grew up a lifelong Dodger fan, and so I had actually met Sandy Koufax a number of times, and in fact, I'm, I'm headed after today, I'm heading up to Vero Beach actually to see him, which sounds like a flex, but is a strange part of this cool this cool job is <laughs> I get the chance to spend time with these guys, and he's still just someone that I have so much respect for. It's not so much, uh, it's it's not a nervousness, or it's just you grew, you grow up listening to stories about Sandy and then to, to be able to build a friendship and relationship with him um, is still pretty amazing. And every one of these guys, really, the answer is, if you grew up loving the game the way I love the game and just being right, just 
you spend any time around them and it is it is an incredible joy and every one of them pretty special in their own right can you give me an audi i'll see about that <laughs> he <doesn't love> the... <laughs> he's not he's not the easiest one to grab he is not but yeah. um i mean but... i figure if you're going up there to spend some time you'd be like hey, hey, I, I, met, I know this guy <laughs> we've met before at dodger stadium I've always been yeah kind of scared to ask him so yeah. like you know you're, you're gonna sit down you're having dinner tonight at the table just be like, hey, Sandy, I got this. Well, ball. when you when you see him again, he actually does, I think, sign for players. I think, yes. he, yeah, he's. he's I've just always been do. scared to ask. I know, him. I know. And in fact, my first time I ever met him, I was actually writing for Dodgers.com back in 2001, and I went over and said, "Hey, Mr. Koufax, um, I probably didn't say hey, but Mr. Koufax, um, I, I'm writing for Dodgers.com. Would would it be okay to ask you some questions for the Dodgers website?" And I remember his answer was, "Well, what if I don't want to be on the Dodgers website?" I was like. That's a good answer. I guess that's all right. <laughs> well, I guess I'm not answering you, asking you any questions. Um, but again, he's just a very private, and and I respect that. He's just uh, he's an incredible human, and uh, very grateful that he's part of the club, along with almost 80 living Hall of Famers. Now, there's a future Hall of Famer that supposedly came out and said he loves coming to the Hall of Fame. Ichiro apparently has been to the Hall of Fame. What did he say? His house, and then the second most place that he's been to is the Hall of Fame. Can you confirm or deny this? Uh, he has, in fact, been there, um, I think, seven or eight times. We were actually, for that athletic story last week, we were trying to keep track of it. And he'd actually been so many times that we don't have the exact record of all of it. Um, but the answer is he just loves going there. He used to come when he was a player in the winter and throw a hoodie on and just quietly walk around. And um, for him, he says it's about it was about when he would pass somebody like a George Sisler or he, getting to know those guys made him understand the record that he was breaking. And you just think about how special that is. Like, that's just not something people do. I mean, it's not obviously the easiest place in the world to get to. It's not as hard as people think, but um, yeah, it's pretty cool. He, he's eligible for the first time next year. And uh, he'll probably get in. Hey, he's probably got a decent shot. I think he's pretty much, pretty much already in. Um, <laughs> I have two questions. Was, was he on the Otani plane because landed in Toronto? Because then, you know, it's not that far from Toronto to Cooperstown. <laughs> he could have just jumped off. But instead, you know, he didn't get off either. He either. did not. We have not had him out to Cooperstown in several years. I think since he's retired, he has not been back, but he uh, used to come a ton. Okay. And then you mentioned each is more than likely going to get in. When do you find out who's getting in? Because I know, like, don't even give me the, I don't know until they open the, the envelope I on the MLB. I won't say that. I won't say that. You, but how hard is it to keep that quiet? Uh, it is actually quite hard. So we, we find out a handful of hours before. It's that day that we'll wind up. We do the tallying and then. Um, we wind up calling the Hall of Famers about half an hour before we go on the air. So they don't even know until about half an hour before. Um, but it's just a very, very, very small number of people in our on our staff who have to prepare for the announcement that know. And, um, yeah, it's not like I'm opening it up like a Oscar award and I don't know what's going on. But um, you what happens if you're like on you're at the podium, right? And you open it up and you see it and you're like, like this year, Mauer and Beltre, and you're like, and... Billy Wagner got in. The, oh, nope. Sorry. Yeah. Wrong envelope. I don't want the Steve Harvey. You remember when Steve <laughs> Harvey uh, did the wrong uh, Miss World or whatever that was. Um, but no, we don't We don't want to know that far in advance because it is hard. I was just talking to somebody actually. Um, oh, Pat O'Connell, the guy that uh, you and yeah. I know from the White Sox. He's involved with the Basketball Hall of Fame and they know for quite some time how they keep it quiet. I have, I have no idea how you keep it quiet when so many people know and you're flying people in from around the country and no one finds out. That just seems... We like it the way we do it, and they like it the way they do it, and it's all good. Are you nervous that you're going to talk to somebody once, you know, in that few hours that you're like, ah, oh, man, I can't, like, and has anybody ever, like, pressured you during those few hours to be, like, on their phone like this, like, hey, just a quick question. Yes, and yes. Um, so what's cool is we have MLB Network up there doing the whole set. and they, I mean, they they take over the, the plaque gallery and they're doing stuff. And so I will know for a few hours. And it is it, first of all, you just I don't like to lie to people. I just I, I will tell them, look, I, yes, I know, but I can't tell you. Um, but I'll get a, an occasional somebody will look at me and say, hey, is it come on? You can't just give me how many or what? what? And I obviously want to for the integrity of the process. I, we want the guy to be, if not the first, among the absolute first to know. And so if, if somehow it were to leak out and they wouldn't find out themselves, that's just horrible. That's not how you want it to work. So it's a process that's worked really well for a lot of years up there. And uh, we're going to keep doing it uh, as long as we can the same way. Just so, just so Ichiro knows, if he calls you a few hours before the announcement, you're not going to tell him so that it's an authentic announcement, correct? 
That is very true. And and honestly, that we had um, we did have a guy this year that was. So what we will do is we'll work we'll work with some people in advance if we because we try to fly them to Cooperstown immediately right after. So we do have to kind of give them an idea. Here's where you should be by your phone, and um, so you just you want to make sure that uh, you don't accidentally call and they're on the golf course. Or the, I think there was a story a few years ago when Alan Trammell was part of, on the Era Committee, and he he had not gotten in a couple other times. And so he was on a plane. I think he just landed at the winter meetings and sit at the back of the plane. And Jane calls him to tell him that he's going to the Hall of Fame. And he's literally like deboarding with a hundred <laughs> other people. And like, probably not your ideal way of doing it. But um, I'm sure he'll remember it for the rest of his life. All right. I don't. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Crouchy. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say, if a tragic thing would happen, like a fire. I know you guys have. I've seen the back room with everything, how it's like fireproof. Rhino, Rhino took us back there, so that was a that's a whole other story for me. But amazing opportunity in the Hall of Fame. What's the one thing that you grab if there is a fire? You have to choose. We we say it on the show. You say it with your chest. We can't we can't hem and haul and grab two things because you got one important thing in your life in your left hand. You got to grab one thing from the Hall of Fame in your right hand. What is it? Oh goodness. Um... Good. Now that's like an impossible question. Um, impossible. Well, I, I would say, um, man, I want to. I would say Jackie Robinson's plaque because that that has just got such meaning. But plaques, you can actually, if we had to remake a plaque gallery, God forbid. Um, so it has to be an artifact. Um, I'm gonna go with the the bat that Babe Ruth used to hit like half of his 60 home runs, and he put a little notch for every homer that he hit. Um, that's on display in the Babe Ruth exhibit. That's an unbelievably irreplaceable artifact, but I could give you about 39,000 others that we consider one of a kind that uh, we've probably got your stuff. We've got I got some stuff. stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's what I, I had a, said. I had a, I had a uh, the, the, what was cool is like when, I, when I've been there, like the Braves, they do like a locker for every team, yeah, right? Yeah. I don't know if it's still there. I've yeah. been there a few years. But when he walked in, the Braves, my bat was like the first thing you saw Cause I got 2000 hits. So you guys have that. And it yeah. was like, it literally like, cause it was, I think it's alphabetical. Well, the Braves are first. So you walk in and the, the first, first thing, you, thing see you see is my bat. That's and it's, awesome. I was like, I mean, I'm probably, you guys probably burnt that by now, but I wish we'd had this conversation yesterday. Cause I would have used you for immaculate grid this morning on the 2000. See, hits the Braves, that's right. I, uh, or the, or Cardinals. I think or, yeah. Yeah, you could have doubled, doubled up. Okay. Doubled. So I have, to, I have to know. I don't Jeff Idelson who was there for a long time before you, he used to do the announcements in Spanish. Do you feel bad that you can't do them in Spanish? I don't because, believe it or not, I speak way better Spanish than Jeff Edison. <laughs> wow. wow, Flex! Wow. We can't wait for Jeff. I can't wait in for one show. He, oh. he knows. No, actually, it's funny. On the first year that I did it, when Oliva and, and um, Minoso got in, um, when we went to break, Amsinger said, um, hey, Jeff, you, he said basically the same question. Are, are you going to try to give us some Spanish? And I said, well, I actually speak Spanish, so yes, I am. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was one of the first pieces of advice I got when I was an intern at the Dodgers in 1995. Someone said, if you want to work in baseball, go learn Spanish. And I took it really seriously, studied for a semester in Spain, lived in South America for a bit, and I, uh, I speak it decently for a, a kid who grew up in L.A. and is in my friend, native language, but I do. Uh, it's been anybody that's watching this wants to work in baseball telling you man the number i'm going to the dominican this weekend with the red Sox and that group and like the ability to engage with people on another language is incredible so did you learn japanese for ichiro next year i actually asked somebody recently if they thought that was a good idea and they said depends on how if, if it's gonna we'll see if it comes across genuine i'm gonna give it a whirl uh, before i know determine if i can learn a, a couple phrases but i can't make any promises yet that's cool okay so can you give us anything new that would you know, stand out to the fans who have either been up there or who have never been up to Cooperstown. Something that's, you know, evolving, under renovation, being planned, right? Some inside intel on what's next in Cooperstown. Oh, I love it. Thank you for asking that, Scott. So the, so the real answer is this Memorial Day weekend, if you haven't been to Cooperstown, is the time to come. We have an unbelievable event going on. So we're opening up an exhibit focused on the history of black baseball, and it goes back to the 1800s all the way to modern times. Um, we used to have one that opened in 97, and it was 25 years old. And so we completely took that down and, and have been working on for two and a half years an incredible exhibit called The Souls of the Game, Voices of Black Baseball. And as part of that weekend, um, we've got a big thing going on that we haven't announced yet that I can't say. But on Saturday of that weekend, we are doing a tribute to the Negro Leagues All-Star Game, the East-West Classic. And we have got a who's who of the last oh, 20 I saw years that. play. It's, it's unbelievable. We went to 
CC Sabathia and Chris Young and said, you guys build the rosters. And it's literally, I mean, it's, it's Prince Fielder and Curtis Granderson and David Price and Ryan Howard and Edwin Jackson and Russell Martin. I could, it's just an unbelievable roster of guys that are going to play in a game at Double Day Field. Tickets are incredibly affordable, like 25 bucks a pop. And um, just a, an amazing weekend full of events over Memorial Day weekend. So if you, if you haven't been, I'd recommend coming for that. Or come out for induction weekend. July 21st is, is the induction of, of the quartet we mentioned before, Leland and, and Beltre and Helton and Maurer. And it's just, there's a lot of really exciting stuff. I mean, this is what I do for a living now, so I could probably spend half an hour telling you all the reasons to come up there and see us, but it's, uh, it's a pretty special place. If you haven't been, you got to make a trip. By the way, so that's I, like the, the, the Negro League East West thing is taking place of uh, the Hall of Fame game yeah right? so for this year we, we've always done a classic where we had kind of yeah. re- recently i played in a, i won the home run derby there you in the derby okay before i got there so um yeah that's taking taking the place of that game for this year and then we'll see what we do in the future got it all right i got one more josh Go now for it, i'm giving you the power to do Ooh. anything that you'd like to do up in cooperstown to make one change it, it is almost the perfect place and better rest i mean from, Better restaurants, okay. You could maybe Sorry. say like outdoor air conditioning at times when there's the <laughs> announcement and some people look like they're going to pass out when I'm watching and I'm like, someone needs to go inside and get a water for a second. But just give me anything. If, you, if you're looking at the whole experience that, that you could change or maybe that eventually will at some point. Yeah, so I would say actually it's strange. This is going to be not be the answer you expected, but I would actually try to find a way to have more housing. Um, it is it is a challenge. Obviously, we, there's only so much you can grow the place because there's not that many places to stay. So, um, and then for pe- places for people that work there, we've got a hundred person staff, and a lot of them are coming in from outside around the, the area. And um, it's not something that the public is certainly not something I thought about when I was working at the Diamondbacks or Dodgers. But the the reality is is that it is it we we probably need some more housing without overrunning the town to make it feel like. Um, something other than what it is. So I, I think that's the challenge that we have and that we embrace is that um, incredible opportunity to do cool things there, but we want to make sure we keep it this this special place that feels like a time machine because if we change that, then we've ruined the essence of Cooperstown. And we don't want to do that, um, but we're going to keep doing all sorts of cool things to engage younger audiences. We've got some, some cool new interactives we've put in there and all the exhibits we're doing in the future will have interactives and ways to kind of keep people... Uh, Keep it. I know I'll always love going there. My parents will, and grandparents will love going there, but it's it's the next generation we got to keep thinking about, and those are the things that we spend a lot of time discussing. I like that, Josh. Great to see you, and uh, thanks for the time, man. Thanks for swinging by. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Thank you. All right, we'll swing it back here, and let's get right back into the news as we keep charging the mound. If you missed our conversation about Zach Wheeler earlier, you can backtrack, but the dude just signed a big ass extension. It's going to be 42 a year over the three years that he signed for that'll extend that contract into him getting to age 37. But the other little bit of news that dropped late at night on a weekend, classic baseball, was Matt Chapman signing up to a three-year contract with the San Francisco Giants. There are a few teams that could use a third baseman. I think this team probably stands out in terms of needing a defensive refresher based on leading the National League in errors last year. And I don't know, having half their staff be ground ball guys. So there are a few layers to get into here. First off, when you saw the news, what did you think? Because before you get to teams, I think most people look at the deal and they say, wow, the Boris four are getting less in total guarantee than most people anticipated. And here's more detail from Andrew Vagerly, who covers the team for the athletic. It's announced as a one-year contract, 16 mil plus two mil signing bonus. So that's really 18, but really it's going to be 20 million for that first year because there's a $2 million buyout as well. So it's 20 million year one. It would be 18 million year two if he stays and it would be 16 million year three, if he stays for the length of the deal. I mean, in a perfect world, he crushes it this year. He goes back to the free agent market and a few teams that are broke find pennies in the piggy bank. I don't understand. I don't know. My first thought, you said, what's my first thought when I saw it? (laughs) Why the heck is it being announced at 1130 at night on a Friday? (laughs) But I guess it's 830 on West Coast time. So, you know, they were working. Maybe that was my East Coast bias. 
My second thought, everybody that has struggles at third base this year needs to look at this contract and be like, uh, we missed. We missed a Platinum Glove award winner. We missed dropping our team's ERA by a quarter of a run. This is, this is a guy that can super impact your team at a position that maybe, you know, I'd rather have a shortstop or whatever. That'll be another discussion when we talk about J.D. Davis, thinking that, you know, he might push Chapman over to short. But anyway, call him. <laughs> another, yeah, or you could actually say something to him. But anyway, that's a whole other communication <laughs> issue that we're going to talk about later. This guy has been elite at third base. And for essentially $20 million, you are getting what this is this is a steal for 20 million dollars because if everything goes well he doesn't pick up his player option that means he has just the same season he had last year he was a 4.4 war player if he puts up that war he will go back out on the market you will have paid him 20 million dollars and the worst comes the worst if he doesn't do that well and he has a god forbid a three war season you're going to pay him essentially $21 million for the next year because then there's another buyout because he's going to pick up his option for just one year. It's not like he picks up his option. He's got to stay for more tons, more guarantee. It just becomes one year deal. This is huge for the giants and a huge miss team one. That's a huge miss Mariners. Huge miss here. Agreed. This huge is, miss. this is in their realm of what they've saved. And this is, Huge miss for the Mariners, especially with their pitching staff. I know they strike a lot of guys out, but when they put the ball in play, you have a guy that can save doubles. That's why his run prevention is so high at third base. He is saving extra bases. He is saving two hits in one. Mm -hmm. And AJ, I can mention other teams too. Uh, the Blue Jays, who apparently made him a nine-figure offer, and that's where the mistake potentially comes in for – Scott Boris and the decision-making group there. I could make a case for the Cubs, depending on how Christopher Morel looks at third base. But if it doesn't end up looking like an above-average third baseman, then I think they're probably going to say, hey, we could have used someone to help us on the run prevention front. So what do you think about the deal for Chapman as a player and then for the Giants? Because now we're starting to look at their offseason and say, it's a pretty damn good offseason for the Giants. I'm still going to say the pitcher gives me an A, Right now, I'm at like a B for them this offseason, but I was at a C before that. I love this deal. Uh, I mean, I love this deal for for the Giants. I mean, Matt Chapman, I, I mean, he thought he was going to get $200 million. He got $54 million. And also, by the way, Scott, you saying that he got offered, uh, what was it, $120 million, nine figures? Fake news, because Ken Rosenthal said it was true, but Scott Boris said it wasn't true. So I'm going with Ken on this one. But, yeah, I mean. Wait, you're going with Ken or Scott? Hold up, hold up. I'm cool with Ken on this one. Right, so Scott, it's real I mean, news. Ken is the one who yeah. said it was 6120. Oh, Sorry, okay. I, I confused you. But <laughs> <laughs> Too many no, annoying no. Scott B's in your life. Yeah, oh, you, ain't, you ain't lying. So, but no, think about this. I mean, you know, Chapman went into this off, at least went into the last season thinking, I'm going to get at least 100 to 200 million, right? People were talking about him getting 200 million. He got 54 and he got his opt outs, I know, but I mean, that's 18 million. That's barely over a qualifying offer, right? So, yeah, there's a million other teams that could have gotten in on this if they knew that's what it's kind of like the Bellinger contract. If they would have known people would take this short term deals, I mean, if I'm Scott Boris, I'm calling 30 teams. I'm not calling just the ones that seem like the best fit because I feel like every team can afford a player of these caliber for the amount they're getting. Yeah, you know, we're looking at, you know, where Chapman was seeking. And obviously a lot of this is reported. So believe what you want to believe, but 150 plus declined 100 plus from the Blue Jays. That seems pretty firm. That's multiple reports from people that I trust and then ends up signing for 54 guaranteed. I get it. You can go back to the market, but we don't know what the market's going to look like next year. There's more competition potentially. And also someone else is going to be broke. There's going to be a new excuse, right? They're going to say we had to pay so much money to fix the uniforms. We can't afford to do anything with the free agent. It? It's always something. The uniforms are going to cost them that much? Is that? That's hey, I'm just saying there will be something next year and we'll go, oh, be a this reason. is the excuse this year, right? It'll be half throttle, at least for some teams. 
But anyway, Bellinger seeking 200 plus ends up getting 80 guaranteed. And I get it. It's baseball. This is how it works. Dudes are rich, but they're not as rich as we thought. And the values have changed, right? Snell seeking maybe 300 plus, declining maybe 168 from the Yanks. Not signed yet. J.D. Martinez seeking 50 plus, not signed yet. And obviously Montgomery not on that board either. Dan Clark with some help here on that front. And again, a lot of this stuff is just reports until we see what the player actually signs for. But it does help to tell the story, AJ, of a group of top tier free agents this offseason that did not make nearly as much money as anticipated by almost anyone. Them, their agency, the industry, writers who are usually pretty good at predicting this stuff. So I agree with you. For the Giants, they waited him out. They took the risk that he would get a better offer elsewhere and they would miss out on getting a player like Matt Chapman, but it ends up working out for them because I'm telling you these kind of wins for a front office are what they take to ownership. It's what they take to the rest of their front office. And they say, guys, we got ourselves a bargain and they potentially got themselves a massive bargain in Matt Chapman. If yes, he's a four plus win player for the team. I don't think you rely on him to be your three or your four hitter, but more of a five, six, seven range, right? Five. If, the bat comes back in terms of power a little bit, and that's a tough park to hit him out, obviously. But six and seven on a winning team, this is who you want in that slot to drive in runs. And then, yeah, he's a top three defensive third baseman, and they've got ground ball city. The pitchers were all joking, AJ, that their ERAs improved by a half run. Kratz said a quarter. Literally, that's what they said to each other. They're all like, oh, we just got a half run better in ERA, right? And Logan Webb's like, I'm going to be even more aggressive you know, going in on righties because I'm just going to get ground ball city and Chapman's going to vacuum them all up. So I think it even helps their pitching staff. Agreed. Uh, everything you said is spot on um, as far as, you know, helping the pitching staff, helping the defense, another veteran presence, a guy Bob Melvin knows very well back from his Oakland days. So I, I, again, I can't find a negative for the giants in this, you know, and yes, Baron Zaidi can now go to the front office and say, Oh, we won, we won, we got them, we got them. But you know, that's a that's a tightrope walk, right? Because what happens if some other team came in and offered them three or sixty? You know, it's just you just never know with these kind of things. And um, it, listen, it worked out this time. Next year, it might be something different. Um, but I, I, man, I, I, again, I love this signing for the Giants. It helps them in so many ways. Lengthens the lineup, improves their defense. That's what you're looking for when you sign a player. Dude, there were comps all over the place. You're just looking back at first off what. He's been offered in the past, apparently rejected one, uh, 10 years, 150 on an extension. We talked about the potential Toronto extension. I was looking back at a Ken article. He said, you know, one club explored the best deal for a platform season when you had a sub 250 batting average and a sub 20 home run season. And the best deal they could find was Curtis Granderson when he signed for four years, 60 million bucks after a 232 batting average and 18 home runs in 2013. Obviously, that's not a gold glove third baseman, right? So you get more value there if you're Matt Chapman. The the other comp, and I can't remember which story I read this in, but they were looking at the defense. And I know there's, there's a bit of a war edge here for the player I'm about to mention, but it's not a crazy difference in terms of the value they bring defense and then where their bat has ranked in the league. Marcus Semien, who signed for seven years, 175 million bucks. I know they're not the same player, but I mean... I think Boris was probably trying to use comps like that when he was throwing Chapman's name around. And why not, right? I'm sure in that big pamphlet that they hand out, he said, hey, look, this dude is an elite top three defensive player at a position where you need someone like that. And the bat is comparable to, say, someone like Simeon over the length of his career. I, I don't blame him. But you also have to look at it. If you are a top tier free agent, you have to look at it. Am I... Garrett Cole to Scott Boris, or am I Matt Chapman? Am I, you know, Jordan Montgomery? Because you get the name Boris behind you, there is a lot of benefits. Is this a miss, and are there more misses like this with the type of player I am, in the sense that Chapman had $120 million on the table? I wouldn't have taken $150 million if I was him from – the from the A's, but that was supposedly out there. Mm -hmm. 120 million from the Blue Jays who are primed to win and you played there last year, you know what they have to offer and you were sold the bill of goods that you could probably get 150 million. 
that you could probably get. Maybe even they said 120 million. Ah, uh, you know what? If I can get it somewhere else, I don't want to come back here. So, I mean, that's also a possibility. But to say he's only getting 54 guaranteed, that's tough. Boris isn't writing you a check for for 70 or 60, 66 million. <laughs> yeah. Like he's just moving on to the next major free agent that he has. He's moving on to building, you know, for Monty and for Snell and for Burns next year. And ultimately, players need to understand whoever their agent is, they are working for, just like teams are working for the long haul. Yes, they are working for you in this moment. They will make you feel so awesome. They will get you everything. But a guy like Boris is looking for how he can raise the market to the point where the player that comes later on in five years, he might not be even as good as you, but he can be close. He's going to get inflation plus on your contract. So he's trying to always push that limit, just like player, just like teams are always trying to squash those salaries down. Is this the AJ. new contract we're going to see, though? The, the short, shorter term opt out every year kind of common contracts instead of the long 10, 13 years? Or, that's, or oh, that's, are, these two, are these two like special cases just because of the situations and when they sign these contracts? I think special cases. I also think this would be a way that teams don't the teams don't have to worry about a, you know, if they don't get a salary cap, we'll just cap it to these one year opt out deals. The thing that will happen is you're going to drive up the annual value per year. And so if you give Blake Snell, if the Phillies give Blake Snell next week, $30 million, you're going to say, okay, well, his year, this is what he got. He got 35 million. I want that for six years. Uh, well, you're not quite, wait a minute. So you drive that annual value up. It could come back and bite them. I just think it's situational, which teams are in play, which off season, which players are coveted and age is always a huge factor. Like none of this in my mind affects the Juan Soto market. I think if no. he has a dynamite season, he's going to get paid. He's so damn young. He's so proven. Right. And I think you'll have more teams involved next year. We have to see how all of this shakes out, too, because some teams are going to be looked at and we're going to say, damn, they missed out this offseason. They had a chance to do this and that. What, what we've seen is there's a group of teams right now that set a price on players and they said, we're not going above this price and they will sign elsewhere and we won't care. But you will care, for example, if you're the Cubs and we do look back at their offseason and they didn't get that much better. In my mind, you could even make a case that they're worse because of what Stroman did in the first half, unless Imanaga's great, right? I mean, you got a reliever and you acquired Bush. We'll see how he looks. But otherwise, bringing back Bellinger doesn't make you better. That brings you back to where you were. So that's one team I'm pinpointing right now and saying, eh, you didn't get that much better. You're not a World Series team. And you sh you could have been right now. Add another pitcher or two, maybe we start talking about it. But right now, I'd still be pissed if I'm out in Chicago and I'm a Cubs fan and I've been waiting for them to pounce again. Okay, so I'm just going to say this. You guys have said that some guys didn't get paid as much as we thought they would. A couple yeah. guys also got paid way more than we thought they would in L.A. One is Shohei, and the other one is is Nobu, right, Yamamoto. He, they, those guys got – and there's some other guys I think if you look at maybe got more, like a, like a, a Montas, right, Frankie Montas in Cincinnati. What did he get, 16 or 17 million? Like I don't think anybody saw that one coming after not having pitched basically in two years. So – it was almost like if you struck early in free agency, you were good, and the longer you waited, the worse it got. Yep. That's a good point. And, yeah, so first off, Otani actually got less than I thought because I'm going up present-day value, and I thought he was 500-plus. Oh. I, I, I did. Seven, he got $700 million. I don't care when he gets to $700 million. He still got $700 million. Uh, financial dollars. disagree, but it, it's okay. I know well, we've, we've done it. If you tell me, Scott, you'll give me twenty for the next 10 years, and then you'll give me 680 for the next 10 years, guess what? I'll take that. And I'm going to talk yeah, when I get But if you tell me 700 mil a billion years from now or 500 mil mm. now, I'm taking the 500. That's a better deal. A billion right. years from now, you're dead. A billion years from it's now. That's not fair. Years. I don't even know. What, I'm going to ask for $1 on million. Dollars. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm taking I'm taking the Shohei deal over, over you telling me I'm getting 544 up front. Okay, that's fair. Um, Jamer Candelari is a good point, though, because his money is pretty similar to Matt Chapman. Who would you rather have? Oh my god, that's not even fair. Who would you rather have, AJ? 
I mean, I'm assuming the answer is Chapman. Yes. Yeah, come on, you know it. Look at that grin too. He's like, yeah, okay. Their money's not uh, that far off. One's uh, what, what was his number? Fifty-four versus forty-five. I mean, in baseball yeah. terms, that's pebbles. So here's Ken Rosenthal on fair territory that was released late last night. His thoughts on this deal. Scott Boris, let's face it, the numbers we expected have not been there. And in this world, in the world of agenting, in the world of contracts, in the world of free agents, what matters is the guarantee. That's what matters. The opt-outs are nice. And yes, all these guys, Bat Chapman, Cody Bellinger, maybe it's Snell too, Jordan Montgomery, if they get the opt-outs, they can go out to the market again. But they have to prove themselves first. So the guarantee is what you always want. And I know all of these free agents have warts. They have flaws. We've talked about them. And the market's been a little bit different. There are reasons why this has happened. Hey, we're good? Okay. Um, so... Anyway, funny part, eventually, I think after that, or maybe a little bit before that, Ken was like, or maybe he had said it, I'm, I'm probably going to get a phone call for saying this one <laughs> for during the week. That is fair. But in all seriousness, when you set your goal as an agent before the offseason started, this is probably not even close to where you thought things would end up. And just to play off of the Candelario statement for one more sec how about the reds if you're the reds and you tell them hey mm. you could have had matt chapman i get it you don't have the same versatility that candelaria could bring you between Stop. first and third but come on if i'm having drinks with nick crawl president of baseball operations for the reds and i'm like dude you could have had chapman this offseason to just put over there at third and also he's a glue guy by the way i mean he's a he is like i would say a 70 grade clubhouse guy i mean maybe maybe 80. I don't know. Like he stands out where people are like, all right, who's leading the Jays clubhouse? Who's taking the mic on the bus? Who's funny? Who's, you know, making a dude feel better if he's going through something. Chapman's high up on that list. I mean, that would have been a perfect fit in Cincinnati. I'm not slighting Jamer Candelari. I'm just saying they're two different players weight class wise. And the Giants got themselves a steal. Ken kind of confirms it on. too. Let's get Nick on because he was awesome when he was on a couple weeks ago. You're right. He was great. He was being, one of the say, people. Being competitive, you're not trying. What'd you say? Competitive. Yep. Being competitive is a loser's mentality. I fucking love that quote. It was great. I agree. Fair territory is out there for the world to consume. Uh, it's on YouTube or wherever you get your pods. If you're looking at the screen right now, you can see a variety of topics. I listened this morning on my drive. So Chapman, Acuna, which we'll get to coming up next. Uh, his conversation with Trout is part of Inside Dish. There's questions, including one about Alex Cora and his job status with the Boston Red Sox and a whole lot more. So fair territory with Ken Rosenthal. But let's get to Ronald Acuna Jr. because he's got some right knee irritation, a little meniscus issue, and that's the surgically repaired right knee that um, was victim of a torn ACL back in July of 2021. Dude was insane to watch last year as MVP of the National League. So Alex Anthopoulos has already said publicly they feel like he'll be fine for opening day, although that's weeks away. They are sending him today to L.A. across the country to meet with Dr. Neil Elitrash, who apparently already saw everything you know on paper or wherever it works, x-rays or scans or whatever, but still wants to see him in person. Um, first off, and then we'll get to Acuna on social. AJ, would you be concerned if you're Atlanta or – it's, it doesn't seem like anything serious, and if anything, you want to slow play it with him because the World Series is the goal, not to be 108 wins instead of 102. No, I mean, I'm not worried yet because I haven't seen the results, and you know, it looks like just a little soreness. It's not like it's when he like he tore his ACL the one year. So let's let's take a step back. I know it's Ronald Acuna. I mean, so he might not win MVP because he misses the first 15 games. Like, okay, but if he's still the same Ronald Acuna for the rest of the games. I'll take I'll take a two week IL stint to get him right and get him ready because he has a little sore knee. So I think when he comes back, you need him healthy, you need him at full power, you need him fully charged and ready to go. And uh, I also don't want to hear oh he just because he played winter ball and he did this and he did that. I mean, stop. This just happens. I mean, it just it just happens in baseball. It's a long year. 
And also, I mean, maybe he just needs a little bit of break. You know, he's like, ah, I need a little time off here, spring training. I played winter ball. I'm re- I'll be ready to go in, uh, what, March 28th when the season kicks off? They, yeah, I love it. He clapped back on somebody at Twitter, too, about the fact that, you know, oh, you should have. I forget who the person said he compared him to. Oh, Nick Markakis, the person on Twitter compared him to Nick Markakis. You should be more like Nick Markakis and not play so hard. First of all, Nick Markakis played Dude, his face off. Is- it was no, 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 he, no, no, no. Nick Markegas played every single day. He played hard. And then he goes, he goes, and you shouldn't have played winter ball. <laughs> Acuna clapped back at him. Oh, we have it right here. Acuna said, I'll be back. And then this guy well, has a blue even, check get, mark. I'm not even going to say it. There's a reason Nick Markegas had such a long career. He didn't play winter ball and hustle all the time. Slow down and play the game the right way. That is so tired. So tired what he said. But the best part is Acuna goes, last year I played winter ball two and won an MVP. Why didn't you say anything? And he had a clown emoji. (laughs) Classic. Classic. Absolute clown with a a blue check mark. I played against Nick, and I played with Nick for two years. He That dude played hard. Every Every day. day. Every day. Now, listen, he didn't take BP on the field. He was the first guy I ever played with that took a lot of BP in the cage. Fine. You know why? Because he was out there every damn day. And you knew at the end of the day, Nick gave everything he had. I mean, it was unbelievable. He was one of my favorite teammates. He didn't say a whole lot. When you talk to him, it was like, all right, dude, I, I, I dig this guy right here. This is, this is what these guys are about. And he was a great guy to have on a team, a great guy for young guys to look up to. Yeah, he didn't say a whole lot. He wasn't as flashy. But, dude, he ran out every ball as hard as he could. And I don't want to hear the bull crap either of like, oh, I'm going to run every ball 100%. Nobody can do it. It's impossible. You run, you hit, you know, how many ever ground balls and pop ups? You get 700 bats like Marcakis did, and you hit 600 balls in play. You're not running every ball out as hard as you can. Nobody has in the history of the game. Pete Rose, Charlie Hustle, guess what? He had a ground ball to the first baseman. I promise you, he wasn't running as hard as he could to first base when the first baseman catches the ball and goes, you're out, and he took one step. It, it's just impossible to do. So, listen, it's it just a bad analogy, but I don't even know what the dude's name was. I don't even care. That dude just needs to go away. But with Acuna, all we heard about the year before, 2022, was his knee wasn't quite right. He even kind of mentioned it. Wasn't quite right. Got it going. You had exactly what AJ said, like what the Dodgers are doing with Walker Bueller. You need your guys down the stretch. With Acuna, you need to make sure he knows his knee is right. Because when stuff creeps up, when you feel a little something, you don't want an excuse in the sense of like, wow, I don't want to steal this base or I don't want to do this. Like, he's a guy that thrives on being out there. We just heard his manager say say the other day. I think that was that Friday we were at Braves camp? No, not Friday. Friday. Friday, we were at Braves camp. Yeah, yeah, the real AJ was there. And he was like, he wants to be out there. He's pissed when he's not in the lineup. He doesn't want to be in the lineup. So you need him to be out there feeling 100%. Would this cause him to not steal 70 bases? I mean, listen, if people are like, well, he didn't steal 70 bases, you got to pump the brakes, okay? 40-70 can be eclipsed. Obviously, anything is possible. But it's okay if he's only a 40-40 guy. You need him in that lineup because he strikes fear into hitters, I mean, into pitchers leading the game off. Mm -hmm. It's funny. I was just thinking, like, Acuna doesn't care about your fantasy roster. And I looked down and and Everett in the chat was like, he's on my fantasy team. Which, hey, same. He's on my NL only team. He'll get you money. Dude, he'll... He'll be fine. Yeah, he he might be a few stolen bags short, but he'll be fine. Ronald Ronald Acuna wants to do well because he's on Scott Braun's fantasy team. He guarantee he doesn't give a shit. (laughs) Just clip the first part of that, not the not the guarantee part. Just the first part of that, okay? And run it everywhere. Everywhere. That's going viral. When I'd be like warming up for a game, and a guy would be in the bullpen, be like, "Hey, Prusinski, I need you to get a couple hits today, bro. You're on my fantasy team." And they're like, oh, because I want to get hits for you more than I want to get hits for me and my family. Yeah, okay, buddy. <laughs> you should have just taken walks just that day just to say F you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Literally, that was never happening. 
No. Well, let's let's get to BetMGM futures on MLB uh, team win totals. So one of three rando teams for you today to cover. And we're going to get to all 30 over the next few weeks and then awards and divisions and all that stuff, right? So let's do the Phillies at 89 and a half dubs, the Angels at 71 and a half, and the Rays at 85.5. Let's start with the Phillies and our Pennsylvania expert, Eric Kratz, over under 89 and a half wins. Just like Hawk would say, this one is over. 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 I'm going over 89 and a half. It may not be enough to win the division because of the division that they're in. And I'm taking it even more before they get Blake Snell in a one-year deal. I I love I love the over here. You saw that little rumor? I like I like a 90 I like a 94 win team. I think they're gonna figure out their first half struggles. So I'm more at the 94 to 96 win team with this pitching staff, giving them in innings. And that is huge to getting th- over that 90 win mark. Yeah, uh, AJ, I'm an over too, and then we'll swing to you. So I do think that there is a chance that they land a Snell or a Montgomery. They've locked in a rate now for Wheeler, and I get it. You got to be careful with the budget, but this team's thriving. They're making a ton of money, and there was the Bob Nightingale report that they could sneak in now that these pitchers are coming down in terms of how many years that they're likely going to command from teams. It would make them very interesting, okay? I also think that the division is probably a little bit worse. I think the Marlins are probably a little worse than last year. I think you could make a case that the Mets are the same or worse. I think there's a clear-cut top two in this division that enables them to thrive. And then I also just think you're still in the prime years for so many guys that um, should have another big year. I think Trey will be better from the first half of the season. I believe the breakout that Larry Boa called on Christopher Sanchez. And I even think the NOLA tweak that he talked about that worked for him in the playoffs carries into the regular season. Do you agree or disagree, up or down? I'll take the over on this one too, just because I don't think the Marlins will be as good. I think, uh, I don't know where the Mets are going to be. I don't think they're going to be as good as they were. They're not going to have to face those guys as many times. And, uh, you know, the Nats are, Nats were good the second half last year. So I, I think, I think 92 is to 93 wins. So I think, I think they're going to win in the 90s. So I think this is easy over. All right. I'll start with the next one. <laughs> you, you love that you get to start with the you next love one. The I love them so much that I'm taking the under. I think they're close to a 100 loss team this year. I do. There's a reason why they're putting them that low. Dude, they haven't been a competitive team by the end of the season in terms of wins and losses, and they just lost Shohei Otani. That's like 12 wins off the board right there. Are we going to see steps taken by some of the young guys? Sure, maybe. And then what did they do this offseason? acquire some relievers that they'll probably flip at the deadline. And this is also a classic case of a team that could look pretty bad. And then when we get to the trade deadline, if they're five, seven games out of a wild card or more, which could be the case, they'll trade away a lot of those relievers that they signed and they'll have a really tough finish. So to me, it's kind of an easy under, even though the number's pretty low. I've got them at least deep into the 90s in terms of losses. This isn't the way. This isn't the way you should do it. But I'm going right here with my heart. I'm going over. Ron Washington's going to put them over. If somebody is going to put them over, it will be Wash. He will get them. He will get the most out of what they have. And I think they have a lot of good, young, cool guys. And I want to see Logan Ohapi. And I also want to see a hellbent trout. Just like was talked on fair territory, I want to see a hellbent trout. An MVP that wants to be an MVP again? I'm taking the over. I got a roll of Kratzy here. I think over. I think the I think the other teams in the division, the Mariners aren't as good. The A's obviously are not going to be any good. I think the Rangers even take a step back. I think that steals them a couple wins. I think this is a – and you know what? Rendon's going to be healthy this year. I just have a feeling. I don't know. You can throw it on Wash. You can throw it on whatever. I feel like he's going to play some more. Some of their young kids are going to stay healthy – the catcher Ohapi is going to stay healthy. I think uh, the what's the, the I can I just blanked on the shortstop. Neto, Neto. Neto. he's going to be healthy. I think Shanwell he stands up all day, so he's going to stand up and and I think they, they can get to like seventy five wins. I think this is this is an over too. Okay, and then what do you got for the race near your hometown, AJ? Under. I just feel like they've lost too much on the on the deep pitching side. No more glass now. McClanahan's out. 
you know, I know they still have Savale. I know they still have Eflin, but Eflin had an unbelievable year last year. Can he repeat it? They lost so much offense. Wander Franco still handing over their head. Uh, I, I just I don't know, especially with that division. Again, the Yankees took a big step forward. I think the Red Sox will be better, especially offensively. I, I mean, I feel like the rest of the division has kind of gotten better. The Orioles should be better. They added Corbin Burns. So I just feel like 85 – I think they're going to be a 500 team this year. So I feel like that's an under. Okay. I'll, I'll tell that. I'll go under. Slightly. I mean, I think they usually exceed expectations. Their bullpen is still nails. I like some of what they've got replacing those starters. But I think this could be a little bit of a development year for some of their young pitching and even some of their young position players. Like Junior Caminero is going to be a stud. But if he is going to play at some point full-time this year for this team, is he going to make quite a few defensive mistakes? Probably. So, yeah, I'll go slightly under. And a lot of it's just – the product to me of a division at certain points getting better. The Orioles are better and the Yankees should be better. And if they sign another pitcher, they'll be much better. Taking the under. Under? And and it hurts me because the Rays figure out, kind of like the Brewers have the last few years, they figure out how to not be under whatever the team, whatever their team is supposed to win. I mean, where'd they start out? 13 straight last year? Is that what that was? 13 and 0, I believe. 13 and 0 to start the season. They didn't play anyone. And then, yeah, <laughs> quote, quote Scott Brown, they didn't they didn't play any big league big league teams. But without that, that they're right around that win type, win total. But they figure out how to have those runs and that's why it's so tough for me to to bet against them, but I'm I'm telling you hardcore here. There you go, and thanks for playing along in the chat. So place your first bet MGM Sportsbook wager through the app of at least 5 bucks. You'll get $150 instantly in additional winnings regardless of the outcome of your wager. Got to use the promo code FOUL, F-O-U-L, when you download the app, sign up and deposit at least 5 bucks into the new account. Place a wager in the amount of at least $5 at standard odds price, and then after that you'll receive $150 in bonus bets regardless of the outcome of your wager. And a big announcement this week when you sign up for the Avet MGM Sportsbook app or on the website during the pre-registration period in the state of North Carolina, you will receive $200 in bonus bets on the first day that the Avet MGM Sportsbook goes live in North Carolina. Welcome to the party, NC. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Free $200. Free $200. You're in North Carolina and you want $200. Bonus Just saying. Bets. Bonus bets, baby. And follow along. Obviously, we'll be very active when games begin, uh, regular season games begin. Um, all right, we're going to finish strong here. We'll get to slap hands. And I know a lot of you have been asking about the spring training schedule. So we will go over a little bit more of that as we continue along here, too. <laughs> What? Did you guys Fire. catch that? They finally Fire. got rid of those scrubs in, sl in slap hands. A little new addition. AJ, are you proud? I did, I can see, so I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Okay, well, slap hands has. No, don't even tell them. Don't even tell them. This is this is. Yeah, a... I'm, I'm, the sun is behind me. I'm looking at a monitor. I have sunglasses on. I can only see is a white hat on Kratz's head. He looks like a chef. <laughs> well, it's then. a papa rally. We're gonna make us some spaghetti. <laughs> what do you got, Kratz hat? Little New Haven Ravens. Uh, hat. Toilet bowl. The toilet bowl. Yale. Yale Field. Most dangerous place to play a baseball game besides <laughs> Oneonta, New York. The toilet bowl strikeout king. You're the toilet visitors. You're the toilet bowl strikeout. Oh man! And you had to walk. The dugouts were from here to freaking Orlando. They make, they make they make Fenway's flush. dugouts look close. Yeah, twenty five flushes later, your crowd was going crazy. <laughs> well, then the hat's got character, and since you can't see it, I'll give it a B minus. I like not a pinstripe fan. No, I think that's the part that brings it up. <laughs> I like oh, the pinstripes. Not the not, the not the logo. The logo has got like a bad Carolina Panthers vibe to it. It's a raven. Like that. Do you see it? It's a raven. I, I, I see it, but actually, when you show it, it 
you need to get pretty close to actually see the intricate details. So this has a little bit of MLB New Unis feel where if you look at it from a distance, I don't know what's going on. It looks like maybe some blue hair on it looks like a wave. A hangnail. I don't it know. It looks like a wave. A wave, yeah. It's just it, it's it's missing New Haven wave. A modern touch. Yeah. So anyway. Um and oh, we do have one thing to show, right? Before we get out. What is it? The new U Darvish move? Do we have that available? Here it is. Did you guys see this? I'm sure AJ did. The Mark Burley attempt at first base. So it's Darvish trying to flip it on the fly. And he, yeah, but he didn't flopped. go glove between his legs like Bailey did, did he? He also didn't get the baseball into the first baseman's glove. So maybe he knew he wasn't going to get him, so he threw it to the second baseman in case he overturned, turned, and overran <laughs> the bag. Maybe he's maybe he's next level. That is next level, I will say. But early a much better athlete than you, Darvish. Just saying. I think Darvish probably agrees, and it was spring training, so it didn't quite work out for him, but. Uh, the spring training tour continues on Tuesday. We are heading to Mets camp. Yankees Mets in Port St. Lucie tomorrow. AJ, you're there? I will be there. I'll Tell be the Yankees there. we're good. We don't need them. We want Mets players, okay? I'm going to grab Pete Alonzo, but I'll make sure he times his coffee properly. <laughs> Just have a cup of coffee for him when he when he strolls up good and be call. like, hey, we know when the game starts. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and don't forget Thursday, we're in uh, Cardinals camp, too. We are in Cardinals camp Thursday. Wednesday and Friday, normal shows, and two guests confirmed already. Wednesday, we will have Brandon Crawford, and Friday features Alex Anthopoulos. Okay, Jay, go get out of the sun. Sunscreen it up, okay? We'll see you tomorrow in Port St. Lonely. <laughs>